The order? Roll call, please. Mrs. Collins? Here. Mrs. Shandy? Here. Mr. Wilburn? Here. Mrs. Yanez? Here. Mr. Salt? Here. The Pledge of Allegiance this evening will be led by Sloan, an eighth grader from DCC Middle School. Thank you. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much. All right. Tonight we have Discovery Canyon Campus, Elementary, Middle, and High School here for our board spotlight. And turn it over to Miss Shandy. DCC is the only pre-K through 12th grade international baccalaureate school in the world. Didn't know that, that's a new fact, that's amazing. And plazas were constructed to mimic the Fibonacci spiral. Uh, interior designs, color schemes and features were designed to inspire inquiry, questioning and discovery of scientific and mathematical ideas. One of the former students, Ashton Pretzel, won a Women's College Basketball National Championship a few years ago and was drafted into the WNBA last spring. That's awesome. They have an award-winning coffee shop on campus called the Canyon Cafe. Please welcome elementary school principal Steve Scott, middle school principal Veronica Lehman, and high school principal Matt Mitchell. Well, good evening. We are glad to be here um, to talk about our wonderful and great school. Um, thank you for this opportunity to spotlight it. I'm Matt Mitchell, principal of the high school. We have Steve Scott, principal of the elementary school, and Veronica Lehman, principal of the middle school. Um, we have an opportunity for you to see a wonderful video that was put together by our secretary, Emily Berry. She worked hard to prepare some highlights of our school. We hope you see that it's a real connected campus, and what we take pride in is that not only we pre-K-12 on paper, but we're pre-K-12 in experience. So roll that clip. Today, we are dedicating our St. Baldrick's event to some very special people that are connected to our campus. These amazing guys have already beaten cancer and have put it in their past.
Good morning. Good, good evening. It's been a long day. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce to you Miss Abby Mitchell. Abby, if you could please come up here. Abby is a brand new fifth grader to DC Elementary with a couple close ties. Her mom is a kindergarten teacher at DC Discovery Canyon Elementary, and her dad is the high school principal at DCC High School. So we are incredibly thrilled to have Abby join not only our campus, uh, but also to be able to speak and highlight what it is that makes us so great. My dad says I only have 30 seconds to talk about DCC, but that is not enough time to share how truly amazing my school is. My school has welcomed me this year as the new kid. My classmates, teacher, counselor, and principal became more like family, and they supported me through su spinal surgery this year. I couldn't believe how much they cared. They have challenged me in my learning, checked in on my emotions, and been a great community. At DCC, you are loved, seen, and heard. And that's what I love about DCC. Go Thunder! Today, for the middle school, I get to introduce Sloane Fabier, so come on up. She is an eighth grader at Discovery Canyon Campus Middle School, and she's also one of our top basketball players. She's also student body president um, for our student council. Sloan's parents are Matt and Courtney, and she also has a sixth grade brother who attends DCC Middle School and is in sixth grade. Oh, one more fact. She's been with us since preschool. <laughs> um, as Ms. Lehman said, my name is Sloan, and my favorite Part, my favorite part about being on our campus is our athletics and clubs and also the school staff. I'm a, bas I'm a basketball player and like many other athletic teams on our campus, in addition to working hard on our sport, we have team dinners and fun end, and fun end of season events. Our coaches teach us to work hard and develop good character, but that we also have, but that we also have to be good teammates and good game players. We have tons of fun clubs throughout the campus, everything from Rubik's Cube Club to fly, fly fishing, National French Honor, Honor, Society, Honor Society, it to Thun, Thunder Coders Club. I love being involved in our school by being part of the student council. Lastly, our school staff members are special. Our teachers plan fun lessons in our academic classes, like our Marshmallow Lab and eighth grade science. Our discoveries are elected or electives classes are cool too, as our school offers things like gateway to technology, peer partnering, and next year in the high school, we will have fiber arts where students can learn to sew. Our teachers really care about helping kids who struggle through our school, helping through our after school help programs and lunch bunch. I, I feel like our staff is invested and will help and is helpful to things and helps us and offers stuff that we need. Uh, it makes coming to school fun. This one is the last time you'll have an opportunity because he's about to graduate, but we're gonna bring Sam Hoghog to up here. He's our student body president, active in Senate, runs cross country and track very well. And his parents are Paul and Leah Hoghog. He has a younger brother, Henry, who's currently in 10th grade. Hi, I'm Sam Hoghauk. Um, one of my favorite aspects about our school is its opportunities for student leadership that are given to and upheld by Student Senate. Um, I've been involved for Senate for about three years now, and I've personally gotten to see the impact that it has on the community as well as on the students within Senate. Um, Senate at DCC serves, leads, and connects with such a great and high level of passion and positivity that it makes the school a wonderful place for all. Thank you. And now we have 10th grader Garrett Locke. He had an older sister who graduated a few years ago, Jessica. His parents, Joe and Aaron Locke, are active in the school as well. Served in Senate, also runs cross country very fast. Here he is. When I think back on my seven and a half, seven and a half years at DCC, my head floods with positive memories, but only one rises above the rest. For this story, we go back to when I was in sixth grade. During this year, our school fundraised over $60,000 for St. Baldrick's, and while this fundraiser is heavily money-based, it is supported by head shaving. 
It was towards the end of the day, and my sister, having organized the event, had a massive weight lifted off her chest, which led to her deciding to shave her head. In a, in a matter of minutes, we were sitting side by side, holding hands, and getting our head shaved. More than just being an incredibly special moment, it was the first time that I had felt truly connected to my sister, considering the large age gap. While this was just one moment, it perfectly encapsulates DCC. Our unique campus uses its K-12 atmosphere to create lifelong memories and unbreakable bonds. So thank you for giving us this opportunity. It's very important for us that we connect our kids and that all of our kids are seen. And if you'd like, as long as the weather permits tomorrow, we'll be having our St. Baldrick's Day Assembly pre-K-12. That's a lot of people in one gym. Thank you. All right, if I can have you guys come up, we're gonna do quick handshakes and a picture and then you guys will be able to get out of here. All right, thank you. Ms. Madsen Bonet, are there any updates to the agenda? There were updates to the agenda and the board was notified of these. Thank you. Members of the board, are there any items you wish to move from the consent agenda? Are there any discussion items to be added to the agenda? May we have a motion to approve the agenda? Moved. Second. Roll call, please. Mrs. Cons. Aye. Mrs. Shandy. Aye. Mr. Wilburn. Aye. Mrs. Janez. Aye. Mr. Salt. Aye. Tonight's board quote is from Ms. Shandy. All right, it comes from the book, uh, Results Now 2.0, that we're all reading together and has been really awesome to go through. The price of substantial progress is a willingness to turn over rocks, even if what you see can really scare you. I changed it just a little bit, but um, that's what we do. That's what we're all doing together as, um, as a board, as a district. We're not afraid of what may or may not be under that rock and we're willing to, to look and evaluate and try to get better. So love it. Thanks for leading us through that, uh, Superintendent Haber. All right, thank you. Does anyone have anything to share for board comments this evening? Mr. Chair, Ms. Shandy, I have a couple of things. Um, I'm not a huge picture or video person, but when you come across the gym in the in the district, it's worth sharing. I was at Legacy Peak Elementary yesterday for community reading night, and Miss Lawrence uh, is a is a D20 gym, and I thought it was worth just really shining the light on her. She speaks English, French, and Japanese. 
It's amazing. So she read, this was just a short little clip. She read Very Hungry Caterpillar in Japanese. And I thought it was worth sharing because it's teachers that are amazing like this are, are worth shining the spotlight on. So. So that was really awesome to see, and I just, I just thought it was worth um, sharing. So, and then one other quick thing: Did you know that we have water polo? here in Colorado Springs. And I met this wonderful lady at Parent Sounding Board yesterday whose family is working really hard to make it a Chassa sport. And um, they uh, have a middle school water polo team and they need middle schoolers. Uh, so I thought that was really exciting and that a sport that you know offsets swimming and hopefully is coming to our district soon. So peak, I think it's peak, um, peakpolo.com or something like that. So anyway. Fun stuff, yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? Ms. Cons. Just very briefly, um, no pictures or uh, videos are allowed during our plays, so nothing to show you, but uh, Mountain View Elementary has been putting on the Lion King Jr. and kid you not, like Broadway worthy. So I went last night, I, I know I say that about every musical in our district because all these students are always amazing, but just the best thing ever. I literally had tears in my eyes at the end because oh, I love that movie. Anyone who's around my age probably grew up with that being one of their favorites. Um, but the kids, the choreography, the um, singing, the acting, the, all the parents who put in, you know, almost all parent led um, building these amazing sets and costumes. So I just want to give a big shout out to Mountain View for putting on an amazing show this week. Anyone else? Ms. Yanez. Um, I was able to get out to Eagle View's um, Arts Night, and I just want to give a shout out to um, the kids that participated with me in Mr. Music's Room, where we got to listen to a piece of music and create a story. Um, they got dark kind of quick <laughs> based on the music. It was hilarious. I kind of went more the Ratatouille uh, vibe, and everybody else sort of went like murder mystery, but um, <laughs> Uh, lots of great things happening there for kids and to walk the hallways and see the kids artwork. Um, it's been a few years since I've been in those hallways with my own kids. So it's really fantastic. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. Next is superintendent comments. Miss Allen, do you have new admin for us? And, uh, Cameron would be here, except he is up in um, Wyoming right now at a job fair recruiting. So it's a good thing. Well, it, it's an honor for me to be able to introduce some of our newest administrators joining us. And I'd like to start off with Katie Smith. And Katie Smith uh, is joined this evening by her husband, Cody, her mom and dad, uh, Kim and Shane. You'll recognize Kim as the principal secretary at Mountain Ridge Middle School. Uh, been just such a, a staple of that school for so long. And I know they appreciate you and sister and brother-in-law, Shana and Drew. It's important to note that Katie graduated, she's a Ram. She graduated from Rampart and uh, she has a Bachelor of Arts in Dance and a Master of Education in Education and Human Resources from CSU Fort Collins. She student taught not far from Rampart at Woodman Roberts Elementary School and went up north to Greeley and Poudre for some time and taught elementary and decided she wanted to come back home to District 20. And uh, we're so pleased that she did. She was at Encompass Heights. She was a teacher on special assignment. And now she serves as an interim AP uh, over at Timberview Middle School. She is also uh, an outstanding product of our cohort here um, to, to earn her principal license and uh, did a great job in that cohort as well. So we are so pleased uh, to recommend that Katie tonight uh, for the position of assistant principal at Timberview. Is there anything you'd like to say?
All right, thank you, Mrs. Allen. It is an absolute honor and dream come to, true to return as assistant principal at Timberview Middle School. I have loved each and every day with the staff, students, and community, and thrilled to officially call this place home. Thank you to all the board members and Superintendent Haberer for your support and entrusting me with this pivotal position. I'm a proud District 20 graduate and am forever grateful for my mentors, Jenny Sturck, Andy Ruskin, and Karina Bierman, as well as all my teachers, colleagues, and students along the way. The love and guidance from my husband and family made me where I am now. So thank you all for so much, or for everything you have done for me. Karina and the entire Timberview community, thank you for allowing me to keep my place in the pack and continuing this opportunity. We have so many great things ahead and I'm humbled to serve as your AP. Thank you and as always, Go Timberwolves. <laughs>
underneath my seat there. So it was wonderful to uh, to have that. It's been uh, very welcoming. Uh, uh, everybody I've, I've dealt with here at the district office uh, over the past few, uh, over the past week has been wonderful. So thank you very much. I'm excited to be here at District 20 and it sounds like wonderful things are going on all over the place. Um, and uh, I look, I'm just very excited to be here and look forward to working uh, with you guys. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Allen. Uh, welcome to our new administrators. Uh, Superintendent Haber. Yes, so we've got lots of amazing uh, celebrations tonight. And the first one I want to start with is uh, ask uh, Patrick Shoemaker to please come to the podium. Uh, he has just recently been selected as the National Distinguished Principal of the Year Award for Colorado. And we do have a gift for you. Heard that you're, these are your favorite colors. Those are good colors, yes. Something yes. related to sports. I don't know. A little know. bit. <laughs> so I'm going to bring this to you here in a minute. Um, so the this is a really very rigorous uh, contest. Uh, and uh, lots of uh, people are nominated for that. Candidates are nominated by a colleague, staff member, or community member. Nominees are subject to a rigorous application and selection process. Uh, that really focuses on their leadership accomplishments, evidence of implementing proven best practices, uh, school and student data, uh, and feedback from staff and students and community uh, and uh, the nominee supervisor. And Colorado selects one honoree each year by committee uh, comprised of current principal leaders from across the state. Uh, and so a huge congratulations Patrick, it's such a privilege to have you serve at the helm of Chinook Trail Elementary, and we're just so proud of you, and it's an award very well deserved uh, by your leadership. So would you like to uh, share anything? Well, first of all, thank you. Um, <clears throat> wow, I didn't think I'd get to it up. Um, I don't think it's without accident that our theme this school year was this, what this school year was our story, because as I put together this, well, it was six essays and went through the interview process over the past week. All I did was retell the story of our great team and what our schools accomplished over the past 13 years. So I may have been named as the award, but I've had a great team. Um, BJ Campbell was my assistant principal for 12 years and Corinne Kessler and Cheryl Dahl are on our admin team this year. And we have an amazing, I'm blessed with amazing, talented staff um, that works incredibly hard for kids. We have a parent community that supports us with whatever we need and are involved in our school. And the most important thing is we have the best kids in the district <laughs> and they made telling our story all worth it. Um, I don't want to go through writing all those essays ever again, um, <laughs> but it was a very humbling experience to look back over 13 years and see all the great work we've done at Chinook as a team. So thank you. So thank you and uh, board if we want to get up front and we'll uh, do the walk of fame with uh, Mr. Shoemaker and then uh, if all of the uh, folks that are here from your school want to and come I, up, we'll take a picture a second because yeah. I made this mistake at Case two years ago where I didn't thank my wife. And I am not going to make that mistake again. So after 24 amazing years and two beautiful daughters, um, I will say being married to an educator has made me the principal that I am because you see the tears and the heart and the work and the celebrations. So not only have I seen it in Tracy, but our daughter is a first year teacher teaching kindergarten this year. Oh, so, and she got that from her mother, not from me. So. <laughs> well, congratulations, Pat. Guys, act like you love each other. <laughs> I 
I'd also like to mention that Patrick will go on to the National uh, Elementary Distinguished Principal of the Year to compete for that. More essays, sorry. <laughs> So as you know, uh, board, we have really been focusing on uh, expanding our influence and building those relationships with community members. And uh, we just recently had a job fair at Liberty High School. We had uh, several folks there applying for teaching jobs, classified, uh, administrative jobs. And I know some of you were able to come at the beginning. I was able to come toward the end. And it was just really a great time to share about the great news and good stuff that's happening here in D20. And as a matter of fact, a uh, principal told me that she had someone fly out all the way from Germany, had researched her school, uh, and came right up to her and said, this is where I want to teach, which is really cool. Yeah, so she interviewed, and uh, I think she had a good interview. So I'm assuming that we'll see her name at some point on the roster. Um, we recently had the... Um, Colorado Springs because uh, I love you uh, group that came and um, put together a, a wonderful kind of a world cafe kind of night for us where uh, they gather together many nonprofits, some faith-based organizations to talk about food insecurity. Uh, and um, I'm continuing to work with this organization to bring these groups together to say, how could we uh, really come together, especially for the families here in D20, uh, where there is some food insecurity so that we are able to uh, work with the community to get food and potentially clothing out to our families that need it. So that was a great night here in the atrium. Uh, recently, too, if I want to make you aware of this, this is uh, the Air Force Academy. Colonel Wentz uh, invited me to this when uh, Tom LaValle and I went out to see the Polaris building uh, because Dr. Colonel Wentz is over the entire leadership group uh, symposium uh, at the Air Force Academy. So the National Leadership Symposium, and this would be for our community as well, is free. Um, it is online with the Air Force Academy. I think they start putting it out in December and January, and they really bring in some spectacular um, speakers. Uh, so uh, during this time, I had I was able to go for two sessions in the morning and heard the crew from the Polaris Dawn. Uh, the astronauts were actually on the screen and we were, had kind of an interactive uh, question and answer and they just presented it is a privately funded spacecraft. Uh, I think they are going into outer space, potentially to the moon. Uh, sometime this summer, early fall, but their goal is to make it so that space travel is possible for the average citizen, not just for astronauts at NASA. So uh, it was really fascinating to hear their in inspiring um, ideas and just what their vision was for that. Um, I don't think I would probably be <laughs> want to do that, but there's probably some people that want to. They just talked about some of the challenges too, like with your eyes when you have all those changes in pressure, it can just wipe out your eyesight and uh, it's pretty hard on your circulatory system. So I'm, I'm excited because I think we'll see some um, inventions around science and medicine that'll come out of the research that they're doing uh, to try to prepare to go into outer space. Uh, but the, um, the girl there on the, the left the, with blonde hair, uh, we had a chance to sit together, so we just started talking, uh, and um, I learned that she is a former graduate of 2019 of Air Academy. Her name's Allie McCormick. So we had a chance to listen to the Polaris Dawn, and then we had a chance to hear uh, Missy uh, Johnson Franklin, who was the five-time gold medalist swimmer. When she was 17, she won five gold medals, and then she went back to the Olympics when she was 21 and won another medal. Uh, but what's interesting is she said when she was 17, she was kind of carefree, excited about swimming. Uh, and uh, so she went and won the medals. But then after that, she said that it, she just felt the weight of representing the United States. And there was a lot of fear and apprehension. And uh, so just talked about that mental battle, battle that she went through to tr try to prepare for the next Olympics. And she has a book out called uh, Resilient Spirit. I know I want to try to read that. She was amazing. She was very inspirational. So Allie and I had a lot to talk about, which was really fun. Uh, but she is a 2019 graduate of Air Academy, and she works for the fire department now, but she is a budding children's book author. And she just wrote a book called uh, Fear or Faith. 
And I asked her, I said, well, has anybody illustrated your book for you? And she said, no, I'm still looking for that. I said, well, if you're an Air Academy grad, how about if I just go down to Air Academy after here and talk to uh, Liz uh, Walhoff, the assistant principal there, and see if there's students at Air Academy that would be willing to illustrate your book. She's like, that would be great. So I got her contact information, gave it to Liz. Liz went and then she is in the process of finding uh, students who would be willing to do that. And I think Allie uh, might be also was excited about just talking about how she uh, got the inspiration to be an author, especially with some of the creative writing classes. So I think it's just, you know, always how do we all just be on the lookout for trying to make those connections uh, with our students and giving them some of those opportunities. And I couldn't help it. I was right at the front door and Matt Westride, the young man on the right, uh, came walking in. He was kind of dragging in and Liz is awesome. You know, she gives him a hug and says, hey, are you OK? And, you know, one of our board ends is character. And this young man, I thought, really showed character because he said, well, I've been up all night. I had to get up around one to take my mom to the airport. I drove her all the, air, all the way to the airport only to find out that she left her cell phone at home. So I had to drive all the way back, get her cell phone, drive all the way back over and get it to her. So he was literally up all night. And he says, but, you know, I knew I had to come to school. So he said, I took an, a, about an hour nap and here I am because I know it's important to be here. I thought, oh my gosh, I've got to tell that story and show your picture because I'm mean, just an example of the amazing kids that we have uh, and uh, the character traits that we want to see in our students. Uh, and then recently I, I went to the Teacher Appreciation Night hosted by the Church of Latter-day Saints. Uh, and it was just really a great time to celebrate our teachers. And the theme that I heard over and over again was uh, students just love uh, all of their teachers, but especially teachers that see them, that know them and help them to understand their strengths and really start thinking about what they want to do uh, when they graduate. And uh, thank you to Director Shandy and Director Yanez. Uh, we had a chance to go to the Capitol uh, and uh, it was great. Uh, Representative Wilson let us be on the floor with them, uh, which was fun. Uh, and I've been to the Capitol now three times in two months. So I know Senator Lundin's like, oh, it's you again. Uh, because every time I'm talking about funding, right? And especially the need to fully fund special education, which still is not fully funded and needs to be funded. And we've also been talking, all of us, and I appreciate you guys being there with us. Um, and we also talked to uh, Representative Puglisi uh, around there is that financial task force uh, that is working to redo the financial formula for our state. Uh, and the way it looks right now, uh, it, D20 could take an, over time about $11 million hit to our budget. And so I want to thank you guys all three times. I've told them, please keep an eye on that. Please advocate for that when it, if, it, if and when it comes to the legislature, uh, because that uh, that's going to really have an effect on our district. So they were all really supportive of our district and wanting to, to help us with that. Recently went to the case, uh, the Colorado Administrator uh, Conference, and what was great about that is there's a, there were several sessions around artificial intelligence and using it as a tool uh, in the classroom and really how it's going to transform our society in the future. So uh, we all learned some really good information about that. And thank you, board, for being the um, the judges of the future chef competition. Uh, these little kids were so cute. I think they're little third graders, and there you are as judges. Uh, and I think you said that little girl on the bottom there won. She had sausage rolls, I believe, and I had one, and it was amazing. Was she? No, was she wasn't sausage. What did she do? Oh, the savory waffle. Okay. All right. They were all so good, and thank you for doing that. And as you know, we went to the Air Academy uh, Air Force Junior ROTC uh, ball, which was awesome. And what I really appreciated about that was just seeing our students and just the examples of excellence again that we have uh, here in D20. And uh, this, we, it was so wonderful to have um, Captain Dominic uh, Lucerio. He was sitting with beside me and I was like, picking his brain the whole way through around the Space Force and, you know, how did he get interested in uh, JROTC? And actually, I think it was his, correct me if I forget, Aaron, I think it was his great um, grandfather or great uncle, one of his uncles actually uh, was in the, uh, was it the Baton 
the 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 march. Yeah, um, that was really awful. Uh, and he said that um, hearing he didn't get to meet him, but he heard stories about what his uncle went through and how he was really proud of serving his country. And that was really uh, the Bataan Death March, right? That was the name of it. And um, just how that really inspired him to want to be able to serve his country. Uh, and he flew in all the way from Washington, D.C., where he's currently working on the future space plane. And of course, he spoke on the theme of Aim for the Stars. And it was so awesome. You could see Dan also was just so excited to see him because Dan was the principal there when uh, this, uh, when Captain Lucario was a student. So that was super fun to be at. And again, just an inspiration of our students. Um, yeah, Laura and I had a chance to be at Air Academy and the student on the left, her name is Elizabeth Rose, uh, appropriately named. Uh, as we were talking here, she is a Betcher semi-finalist. Uh, um, and as you know, the Betcher Scholar is a full ride scholarship to any uh, college in the state of Colorado. And I, she is very interested in environmental uh, and plants. I said, well, how did you get interested in plants? And she said it was during COVID. Uh, because it, when during COVID, she had to stay home. And, and she said, so I started looking at the flowers in my black backyard and all the different plants. And then I want, thought, well, maybe I could identify them. And uh, so she is really enthusiastic about that. So we had a fun time talking to her. <laughs> uh, and then we were standing in Allie Johnson's room and in come these students, uh, Kelly, Kellen Greco, Aaron Bailey, Ethan Latandre, Rama. Kamash and Briley Steinman, and they were so excited because they were running for president. So two of them are running as a Republican president uh, for the Republican Party and two of them for the Democratic Party. And they were excited to tell us about their platform. And then I said, well, what is your main message? And both of them, uh, both sides of the party said, you know, our message is the importance for bringing us all together. We're tired of the division uh, as students and we want to find something uh, that we would have in common that we could work together on. So I thought, you know, future of our nation is in good hands. Um, then the Academy Endeavor students, I was there after they just got back from a field trip and a huge shout out to our Air Force Academy uh, and the partnership that we have with them. Uh, our students get to go and watch the basketball games uh, for free. They get to be on the Jumbotron, what, what, what's better than that, right, as a um, third grade student. And so we just really appreciate them. We have such amazing teachers. So I was able to catch uh, some teachers in the action at Academy Endeavor. So um, Ms. Brewer, our Spanish teacher, who the teacher that has her hands up in the air, those are kindergarten students learning Spanish. And I was just mesmerized. Uh, Sheila Hansen, I didn't even realize like 25 minutes had already gone by because she was just so interactive. And uh, the amount of Spanish that the students were uh, sharing was really amazing. Uh, and then uh, Mrs. Doyle on the right is a music teacher, and she is showing them the moves for Aretha Franklin's Respect, because respect was the character trait of the week. And then on the bottom, Mr. Brubaker, our PE teacher, this is a traveling uh, set that goes to different PE um, schools, PE classes in different schools, and it's a circulatory system. So you can see on the right, the kids on the scooter there, they are blue blood cells, and the kids on the right, uh, left are red blood cells, and they go through the circulatory system, and they, you know, switch out one red scooter for the blue, and it's just really fun to watch and uh, talk about hands-on learning, and I don't think that's something that they're going to forget, which is good. And I'm hoping this little video will work. These are kindergarten students. Oh, Oh, they're getting it. Perfect. And they are doing a weather forecast. Hello, astronauts. Today's precipitation will be snowy. I'm going to wear a hat today. I'm going to... Try one more time, see if we can get it. Oh. There we go. Let's see. All right. I'll try one more time. I'm going to wear my hat today. I'm going to. Uh, well, you get the idea. Um, They're amazing. Some the... snow. Oh, there it is. 
gloves and some and a coat and some boots. I am gonna slide down the ice east because I want to pretend I'm on an ice skater. <laughs> it's sunny today. Oh, I think I might grab my water because it's gonna be really hot outside. What are you gonna do today? I'm going to play fetch with my pet dog. Just doesn't get any better than that. I mean, they are just amazing. And they're, you know, already uh, uh, budding weather meteorologists, which is so cool. Uh, then I was at Douglas Valley Elementary and I was so excited. I got to spin the wheel for uh, some prizes uh, for a character uh, uh, lesson that they had had and a group won some little plastic dinosaurs. And then uh, Adrian Mari, our wonderful principal there, showed us this kind heart uh, board where students can put a heart up and give, make a little message to somebody that did something kind for them. So I thought that was a great culture builder. And then at Frontier um, Elementary, I uh, had a chance to meet these amazing teachers. And uh, Mr. LaRue is an art multimedia teacher and he had students uh, make the world that they would wanna live in. Uh, so they made a world and then they talked about what would be the ideal world that they would wanna live in and what would that, what would that be like? So just had some great ideas there that students had. Um, and then uh, our preschool, preschool teacher, Mrs. Andino, uh, she's a special ed preschool teacher. She was so passionate. Like I just was had so much fun being in there. And what's cool is those little um, drop downs are all the different students in her class. And they she has that running like a, if they say like a well-oiled machine, right? So all the kids knew what their routines were. They'd be like, excuse me. And they would put their little check where they were uh, on their routine. And then they knew where to go next. And the kids were all moving around and with purpose. And I just thought that was really empowering for preschool students. So um, was, again, another inspire, inspirational time. Discovery Canyon, I had a can chance to go to She Kills Monsters. I had to rearrange my calendar and I wasn't sure if I could go the last minute I could go and I saw Heather in the uh, lobby and she said well we happen to have an empty seat by us so I had a chance to sit with her and then I met uh, Julie Ott who is a D11 uh, board member as well and um, just always appreciate Heather because she introduces me a lot of people so I met a lot of students and other folks and I will tell you this play was very pro professionally done um, and the students were amazing. Uh, as Pine Creek High School uh, for a girls swimming uh, champions, uh, state champions. I think they won that again. They won that last year. Uh, and I think they're already predicting that there's a good chance they could win it again next year, right? Uh, so we are really proud of them. And the swim coach is amazing. He is up for swim coach of the year or was selected as coach of the year, I think. Um, we went to see the swimming pool. If you haven't seen the pool, a thank you to our community for the bond because it certainly is an amazing facility. Uh, and then Pine Creek leading the way really with their um, unified sports. Uh, and this is um, the unified sports basketball team. And I'll just show you, if you haven't ever been to one board, please try to make it. It is just so amazing um, to watch these students and uh, I'll show you why. So uh, it's awesome, very inspirational. Uh, on March 9th, they will play in the Unified Showcase game at the Chassa State Finals. And then uh, Pine Creek will participate in the High School Basketball State Finals for the Special Olympics. So Pine Creek is really leading the way uh, with their Unified Sports and um, pairing up with the Special Olympics. Um, our um, Air Academy, we had some students that won some major awards with um, DECA. And um, Allie tells us, let's see, who is it? Um, that this student, he, the students here, they've worked in, worked several hours to getting these awards uh, and uh, they are going on to qualify for state. And then uh, Mr. Wilburn, would your direct, Director Wilburn, would you like to talk about your son? I know I had a chance to talk to the JROTC uh, class because I know that your son is a fighter pilot. Do you want to just share a little bit about your son and the message that he had to them? I'd be happy to. Um, so actually he flies tankers. He's not a fighter pilot. So our oldest is a 20, is a D D20 graduate. 
as are all our kids. Uh, he's a 2018 graduate of the Air Force Academy, 2020 graduate of Air Force Flight School, and now he's stationed in Spokane, Fairchild Air Force Base uh, in Spokane, Washington. Um, he's promoted to rank of captain, and they just promoted him to left seat. PIC, uh, pilot in charge. So he had to report to Altus Air Force Base in Oklahoma for PIC training for a couple of months and decided to drive. So we used our house here in Colorado Springs as the halfway point, spent a couple of days with us, and then went on down to Oklahoma. Uh, on his way back, I asked him, would you consider going to the JROTC program at Air Academy and, and talking to the kids there about uh, being a pilot and getting into the academy and life in the military and what have you? He said, I'd be happy to. So we were there, I think it was two Fridays ago. He spoke to the aerospace engineering class, um, which was great, just bunch of questions that Becky Allen would ask. Uh, uh, all uh, uh, very fact-based, facts, figures, fluid dynamics, all this type of stuff. Uh, then we spoke to all four of the ROTC classes, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, about what it takes to get into a military academy, what's life like once you're in an academy, what have you. Uh, Dan Olson uh, and I set the whole thing up. Mr. Olson's incredible. I said, maybe um, we can get Colonel Huber and, and have somebody in the classroom that high schoolers may find a little more relatable than those of us with a bunch of gray hair. And they pulled all the strings and made it happen. And we spent the day at Air Academy uh, two Fridays ago. That's awesome. Thank you so much for giving our students that opportunity. That's really awesome. And I got a lot of positive feedback too from Colonel Hubert and the students that heard. him. So I asked uh, Ron Alexander, our district athletic director, to just kind of give me a rundown of all of the amazing uh, awards and celebrations from sports. And I'm not going to read through all of them, but they're all here uh, and um, it'll be in board docs so we can celebrate them. But you can see Liberty, Discovery Canyon, Air Academy. Um, and I did get an update, Air Academy girls basketball uh, did go uh, to the state championship, but they lost their game for very close, 66 to 70 in overtime this afternoon. Yeah, they're very close. Um, and uh, Pine Creek, uh, boys wrestling. Uh, I know I got to sit near the champion, the student who has just won many, many awards in that um, area. And then certainly you can see the times for our state meet records and the list of all of our all-state swimmers. And uh, Coach Kent Nelson was named as the 4A Coach of the Year in girls swimming. So huge congratulations to him. Um, and Discovery Canyon also brought home a 4A state debate championship. So there are great happens here in D20 and we have a lot to celebrate. And that's the end of my report. Oh wait, no it's not, I'm sorry, one more. This is really amazing too. So we had three students at the uh, J, uh, Air Force JROTC who won uh, full ride scholarships. And what's amazing about this is there's only a hundred given internationally and there's about 850 different uh, JROTC programs across the world. And there's only a hundred that were given total and three of them went to students uh, in our district. Uh, two, one of them from Pine Creek, Emma Erickson, and two from Air Academy High School, Ryan Went and Wyatt uh, Bagues. So uh, again, again, great happens here in D20, and uh, we're just really proud uh, of our students. And now it, that's the end. All right, thank you. We're going to take about a five-minute break to congratulate the new administrators, and we'll move on with the rest of our meeting. Thank you.
All right. We need a motion to approve the consent agenda as posted. Moved. Second. Roll call, please. Mrs. Cons. Aye. Mrs. Shandy. Aye. Mr. Wilburn. Aye. Mrs. Janez. Aye. Mr. Salt. Aye. We have 38 attendees remotely. Uh, there are no items pulled from the consent agenda, so we'll move to the written reports. Uh, for the annual monitoring report for EL 2.8, emergency superintendent succession, does anyone have any questions or comments? All right. We'll need to do the MRA. Is the superintendent's interpretation of the policy reasonable? Is there sufficient evidence to determine compliance for each section? Are all sections in compliance? Recognition of exemplary performance or concerns regarding performance? Would you like to see additional different evidence or should any part of this policy be changed in the next monitoring report cycle? Do you see evidence which is extraneous or no longer necessary? Okay. Next is the accreditation handbook revisions for school year 24-25. Were there any questions or comments? All right. Uh, next is the Board of Education proposed discretionary budget for fiscal year 24-25. Were there any questions or comments? All right, moving right along. Presentations, uh, parent choice and library book, Superintendent Haber. Yes, I would like for um, Dr. Field, uh, please. Good evening, board. I was like, where is she? Sorry. I'm right here. So it's my pleasure to introduce Tacey Killingsworth, who's our director for curriculum instruction, and Carol Bram Schreiber, who is our district literacy library and media specialist. Take it away. Good evening. It's an honor to be here tonight. Um, and like Dr. Field said, Tacey Killingsworth, Director for Curriculum Instruction and also um, Overseer of Libraries. Um, and so it's a pleasure to introduce Carol Bramschreiber, who's so, just going to review for you um, some of the great options and choices our parents in Academy District 20 have when it comes to engaging with their children into, into the library world, if you will, and talking about reading and what's important for them as families. Thank you, Tacey. Uh, Superintendent Harbour and Mr. Salt and board members, thank you so much for um, talking about books again. I appreciate that. Um, today, I want to talk specifically about the importance of family engagement and ways that our families can already access um, the Destiny Catalog. It is our library um, catalog that's online, and any time you have Wi-Fi and access to the district website, you have, dist you have access to our catalog. So um, tonight, I'd like to share specifically the ways that families can engage with school libraries to promote discussion about what their child is reading. Our goal as a district is to have consistent communication for all families to know these options. The document that I provided for you in board docs um, is a draft of what will be posted on our school websites. We've worked with the communications department to ensure that our information is accessible on the web, which is why um, it's in the bulleted format that it is to make it easy for screen readers to access. Additionally, we'll continue building visual tutorials for folks who would prefer to have screenshots of the steps along the way. Um, that's taking a little bit more time. Uh, these strategies to involve, um, they all involve the district's online library catalog, Follette Destiny Discover is the name of the catalog, which anyone can access if you have Wi-Fi 
and a device at any time. These strategies can encourage family conversations about what you each love about reading, about how to read book summaries uh, and awards to narrow down choices. We have thousands of choices and it feel, if it feels overwhelming, those conversations can help your child understand um, what you look for as a reader. Um, it also can help conversations about what your family values when exploring ideas. It um, can help you talk together about what your child should be reading independently, what they might read with you as a partner, or maybe what you each find a copy for and then get together and have a little book date or something. Um, most of all these conversations demonstrate the value that we place on reading not only within the school day, but also the opportunities afforded to us outside of the school day because reading opens our world. I wanna briefly summarize um, the ways that families can engage with their child's self-selected reading in, in the school library. The first option or the first tutorial is about ways to access the Destiny Discover catalog. Students logging in find their student hub, they can click on the library icon, it takes them to the catalog. If you have your student sitting next to you, it's a great way to start that conversation. Also, if your student isn't with you, you can go to the district website and log in through Follett Destiny. If you would like to know what is currently checked out to your student, we also have instructions there so that you can have your student log in, go to My Checkouts, and click on it and you can click on the titles they have checked out to access the summaries of what they're reading, maybe some related stories, some different areas that they might want to read if they're really interested in the book. Um, searching and advanced searching are basic library skills, but sometimes we live in this world where we are flooded with information and we forget the basics. And so making sure that you know how to use the basic searching. And then the other piece that our families need to know is that when you do advanced searching, you can gauge the interest level of what you are searching for. So for instance, if you have a middle schooler who's ready for YA books, you can actually check YA as a starting age or starting interest level and YA for the ending interest level. And then anything that you search will be in that YA range. Likewise, if your child is not ready for YA, they can search for grades four to six and look up all the fantasy titles in that library, and those will be the results. Every title that comes up will say um, the title and the author, where to find it in the library, and it will also name the interest level so the student can find it when they're using the digital catalog. Uh, and last but not least, if that overwhelming number of thousands of choices available in a library is too much, you are welcome, and I'm leaving instructions hopefully on our website that will guide you to create a family collection. So in our Destiny catalog, students can log in, create a collection, and you can sit with your child to say, there's thousands of choices, but here's 40 titles that I think you should read in sixth grade. Um, and that way you and your child are talking through, why are you putting those books on that list? Um, what is it that you like about it? Are these classics? Um, you know, how, how is it that you want your child to engage with those specific books? Finally, we also know that kids in all their different developmental stages, some kids are not ready at the same time other kids are. And specifically young adult literature, YA literature, which is geared for ages 12 to 18, can be problematic because kids mature at different ages. I mean, I just think about the number of kids at 16 who are not ready to drive. Sometimes that's a family decision and sometimes that's the child's decision, but just because you turn 16 does not mean that you're ready. We also have school parking lots. We know our freshmen typically don't drive and yet we have parking lots because we have drivers and we use that to facilitate the learning to get the kids to school. Likewise, our school libraries, maybe not all of the materials are appropriate for all of the students, but developmentally along the way, there can be different kids that will meet that need. I think it's really important that families then know if my child's not ready for that more mature content, what can I do? So those four strategies I think are ways that you can work at home and then our librarians would like to partner with families. If you have a concern specifically about YA titles, young adult titles, um, we do have in middle schools now a way to block those titles for those students. Um, and then we also have ways like our parent technology agreement where we um, limit your access to all information. 
So that is a very quick overview. Are there any questions for me? Uh, first, I just want to say thank you, Carol. Um, I know uh, when I got here, there were different rules, right? There are different ways that um, parents could have choice around uh, what their students read. And they were all kind of different at different schools. And I just appreciate you. I asked you to bring the librarians together. We had that great session to talk about what was already in the schools. And then I asked librarians that they'd be willing to come together, come to consensus around what could we say is, is true, right? Around parent choice and uh, the different ways to guide students through those choices. Could we come to consensus around that? So thank you. You guys did an amazing job. Our libraries, uh, librarians are amazing and the folks that work there and just did an, a fantastic job, I think, of putting all that together. So thank you. Thank you. And we're eager to put that out. We wanted to present it to the board first uh, and then all the principals, it's been shared with them. They're going to put it on the website. So we'll put it on our website and just share it widely so all of our parents uh, know about these choices. So Terrific. thank you. I really appreciate you. If I can just share two quick things. We celebrate the 100th day in kindergarten. Today, I believe, is the 100th day of our new policy. So, Yay. <laughs> worth celebrating. And we also have a million thirty-seven thousand circulations since August 1st in our district. That's awesome. So we have kids that are reading and reading. extending their school day and hopefully falling in love with literature. That's great. One question for you really quick. Do you have an idea when you'll have the screenshots and sort of the visual aspect to go along with this? I need to go back and work with IT to make sure that what I think is correct is really correct. Um, and so I'm thinking maybe in the next week, Perfect. we should be good to go. Nope, that's great. Thank you okay. so much. I really appreciate it. Yep. Thanks, Thanks, Carol. All right, next is the strategic planning update. Superintendent Haber. Yes, so we have Dr. Smith, I believe. Um, yes. Virtually. Yes. Yeah, good evening, board and Superintendent Haber. I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to present from home. I've been under the weather for a couple of days and hoping that we're on the the uh, recovery side of things, but we're excited tonight to share with you the progress that we've made in our strategic plan through the third quarter this year. And while we're going to focus mostly tonight on uh, academic achievement, all targets and metrics for academic achievement, as well as the other six strategic objectives are in the board packet. So if um, folks are wanting to see the, the updates for all of the six strategic objectives, we do have that posted. But before we get, oh, next slide, please. But before we get too far down the road, we always like to stop and remember what our guiding North Star is, what, what our focus is, and it's the board's global end statement. It states all students will have the knowledge, skills, and character necessary for successful transition to the next level, and upon graduation will be fully prepared for success. So this is a measure that we kind of think about, a funnel that we think about when we're doing the work with our strategic plan to make sure that we're in alignment there. Next slide, please. Right. And as I've shared before, we really started this work back in 2019. And um, obviously, as a lot of things happened uh, during the pandemic, progress slowed on developing the strate strategic plan. But as you can see here, we began in earnest rolling it out in 2021 with cultural belonging. And then now, next slide, please. This year, we have all six strategic objectives in play and all six strategic objectives not only are posted but they also have the targets and metrics associated with each uh, of those and i think if you're interested in, in looking at data and looking at how this is actionable this work becomes actionable i'd really encourage you to look at the update document that's in the board docs packet okay next slide all right i think i've already said this but tonight you know we're going to uh, talk really about academic excellence and achievement. Um, and at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Susan Field, Dr. Field, to introduce the work around academic achievement and excellence. I'm glad you're home, not sitting next to me tonight, Jim. <laughs> me too. Yeah. So it's my pleasure to introduce Andy Ruskin. She's going to kick us off on literacy, and she's just going to give a brief overview now because we're going to go deep into mid-year data right after this report. And then following Andy will be Tacey Killingsworth, who's going to talk about our math initiative. Good evening, board. I'm happy to be talking about literacy with you tonight twice. So this will be a quick um, overview, and you'll get to hear more later, as Dr. Fields said. Um, 
As you know, Academy School District 20's literacy goal is that by the end of the year, third graders that have been with us for the three benchmark assessment windows will achieve one of the following. Thank you. There we go. Um, one of the following, at least 85% will read at or above grade level according to Dibbles 8. If not proficient, they will have moved out of the well below range or they will read with 95% accuracy. We hold the same expectation for our fourth graders that did not meet the goal last year. So we're keeping a close eye on that group. Um, as you can see, at mid-year, 40, excuse me, 74% of third graders are already reading at grade level, at or above, and 114 of our fourth graders from that 157 student cohort of third graders that did not meet the goal last year are reading with 95% accuracy. So our mid-year number was 79, we're already at 114. So based on these mid-year targets um, and results, we are on the track to meet our end of year goals. Good evening, back to talk about math and also giving a brief overview because I know Jolyn will talk about this more. Um, so I actually just wanted to remind you, I didn't put the goal on the slide. I know you also had a template, um, but our end of the year goal for math is that we would increase the number of students reaching that 500 or above cut score on the math SAT uh, by 5%. And you probably recall that CDE sets those cut points. So 500 means that if a student reaches that, they've um, met that expectation for um, graduation proficiency, if you will. We set a mid-year goal of students reaching the 61st percentile, which I'll talk a little bit about in a minute, by February, uh, mid-year benchmark testing. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about what that data looks like. So the first slide that you see is, um, I wanted to show this because this is data you're probably more familiar with. You'll see at the top it says school normed data, which means that's comparing our schools as a whole, if you will, to other schools in that same normed category, right? Um, and so this is the data you see how we're doing overall as a school. So the left side is um, the math percentile. So for instance, if we look at first grade, uh, middle of the year, you see 80%. So that means as our first graders scoring equal to or greater than 80% of the schools in that norm reference group. So you can see over years, right, from 21 to 24 um, in Academy District 20, we score pretty high compared to the schools in that normed group. Um, the data on the right is the median growth percentile. So how much are students growing in that normed group? And our hope for is that we'll be 50 or above. So you can see also across the data that um, from year to year in most of the grade levels, now that's comparing new groups of students every year, but we're doing relatively well. What I like to do with this chart too is look at that diagonal. So like if they start at 48 MGP in kindergarten, where are they in first grade? You'll see they dipped to 44, went back up to 48 in second grade, and then 52 in third grade. So what we know is that as we keep kids over time, that we're also growing them at higher rates. So that's kind of an overview of just um, the overall normed performance. But the second slide is what we chose um, in order to set our mid-year benchmark of 61 percentile or above. And the way we get that number is when you look at this, this is student normed data. So when we start breaking down the data point to the school level, this data shows how a student does compared to other students in that same group. And so it looks a little bit different than the overall school norms, but we use NWA map growth as a predictor. So they have done the linkage study is what they call it to show if a student scores at a certain level, they'll be successful on both CMAS and reach that 500 SAT for math. What we know is even though meets is uh, between 41 and 60, we see the linkage study shows that our students need to score at 61 or above to truly be on target to meet that 500. 
So the data you have on this sheet shows where we are, and it shows that over time, right, from 22, 23, and 24, and you can see we're increasing, um, and most of our grade levels are 61 or above. We have a few that are a little bit below, but we're, we're getting better each year to get students to that 61, 61st percentile in order to be successful on that cut score. Any questions about that? Like I said, I know Dylan will go into more detail, but. Sure, on the last slide where we talked about the school norm data, I just yes, wanted sir. to clarify, because you're talking about comparing like first grade, that's district-wide first grade Correct. and not one school specifically. Correct, right. so that's all of our first graders together. Yep. All right, thank you. And then Dylan's gonna break down school data. <laughs> Mr. Wilburn. Um, this is more of a, a detail question than anything. It's more going back to Andy's portion of the presentation. Um, somewhere in the middle of your report, I think it was around page 10 or 11 or something like that, indication was made that the switch was made from Dibbles 8 to Dibbles Next. I'm just wondering if that was instituted on their end or our end, or is there some obsolescence in there? Why, why was that? No, that's a great question. So we actually um, have a grant through CDE. It's the Early Literacy Assessment Tool Grant. So it pays for assessment licenses licenses for our kindergarten through third grade students um, and through that grant they and the research that they've done and the companies that kind of um, applied for um, that um, that testing um, platform for the schools um, it shifted from dibbles next to dibbles aid so um, there are some slight differences in the assessment. I'll talk about those a little bit more, but it's really because we're um, tied to a grant um, through CDE, and that is the assessment that they chose. Okay, Did so it wasn't any, any reason other than that? Okay. Nope, just saving a lot of money and getting the same da data for it. Yep. Or any other questions? All right, thank you. All right, next is the mid-year assessment update, NWEA map growth and Acadians read act data. Superintendent Haber. Yep, uh, and we have Dr. Susan Field and Jolene. It's coming up one sec. And Andy, yes. So this is our mid-year assessment update. And uh, they'll, they'll, Andy and Jolene will talk about when students were assessed, um, some before the winter holiday break and some after. But this is our mid-year map growth and our REDACT Dibbles 8 report. Take it away. So as advertised, Andy and I will be sharing some information with you. Tonight, I will be looking at our benchmark data from map growth, and then Andy will be sharing around Dibbles 8. So, um, I guess I'll keep clicking. So some of the things we want to think about is that we just heard about the strategic plan, and so we saw some of the data reflected there. You may think back to when you first started your new jobs here as our board members in December. Dr. Field and I presented on the E11 report, which included some of this data as well. So tonight we're going to look a little forward in how our students performed from fall to winter on our map growth testing. So just a little background, map growth is one of the assessments in what we call our balanced assessment framework. So we want to assess kids in different areas. And so we have formative assessments, summative assessments. This assessment is what we would also refer to as a benchmark assessment. So students are gonna test two or three times a year. So we're gonna be able to see how they're doing before we get to a CMAS or our state testing, which would be a summative assessment that we would do one time a year. This assessment is done, um, it's computer adaptive. It is nationally normed. There's over 11 million students nationally that participate in these assessments. It is also aligned to the Colorado academic standards. And one thing that's unique about map growth is it really provides our teachers um, information about their students' instructional level. So instead of saying JoLynn's at a third grade level, it would say this is what JoLynn's ready to learn by specific skills and information so that teachers can target instruction um, for their students. 
so we have language arts and math. And so kids in grades four through 10 participate in language arts. And that's because our students are already participating in the Dibbles testing for REDACT with, I'm um, pointing at Andy like it's her, but, um, no. <laughs> but it, the literacy piece. So some of our schools do choose to test their students in K3 on map growth as well, but that is optional because we just wanna be conscientious of how much testing we're doing with students. And then our students kindergarten through eighth grade test on the math platform as well. So then when um, Tacey Killingsworth had referred to some of our data, so this slide I will tell you is the exact same data um, that Tacey shared. And so it looks at, as she shared, um, so with map growth data, they're looking at um, average scores. So we're looking at math achievement here on the left and looking at those percentile scores. So for example, if we look at 2004, the kindergartners scored at a 94th percentile, meaning as a group, they scored better than 94% of the students that participated in this assessment. And then we're looking at on the right hand side of the page, we're looking at map growth, which is that median growth percentile score. So when we do a median, they take all the student scores, they line them up and they look for that middle score. And so that's where those scores are generated from. So we have those pieces by um, each grade level. Tonight at your um, seats, I gave you um, data and information by school as well so that you can take some time and look at that. You'll want to look carefully at the top left corner because it'll say whether it's achievement data or whether it's growth data and whether it's math or um, reading ELA and then the different levels. So the front of your packet looks at the elementary schools and then the middle schools and the high schools compared to each other and how they're performing. So another piece I want you to know is that you have access to a OneNote where we've stored historical data and information. And so that might be something we want to go back to for um, some of our newer members to make sure you um, know how to access that. So all this data has been put in there as well. And then when I presented data previously, we put it in that OneNote for your reference as well. And then there's a lot of information around, um, it would have the graphic we used for our balanced assessment framework, some of the work I did this fall with the board. It's just a place that you all have access to that you can um, go back and find that information. And so all of the green and yellow is what I would say tonight, the packets that I gave you um, are also a lot electronically prepared in that one note for your reference as well. Um, so the next piece we're gonna look at, and one of the things we wanna really think about too is, Really where we make change is when we start looking at the data at the individual school level, but really the individual grade level and the individual teachers, and then at the student level. That's where we see the most work and the most change for our students. So this next slide looks again from fall to winter, and this is looking at reading. So we've represented grades four through 10 um, in the achievement side on the left-hand side of the charts. And then on the right side would be those growth percentile scores again, um, the median growth percentiles for our students. And again, looking at how they performed at a school norm level uh, compared to other students across um, the United States that have participated in this assessment as well. So thinking about all of these scores and what do we do with this information? So really thinking about the action that happens. So professional learning communities is where our teachers have a chance to collaborate. They have a chance to look at data and have discussions and talk about instructional practices. Why has Joe Lynn's group of students versus Andy's group of students? And we don't really get to teach the students, but um, <laughs> I'm using as in theory. But um, like, how did they compare differently? Am I teaching something differently that's helped my students? How can we help each other grow as teachers um, in supporting our students? So that's an important bedrock of all the work we do in the district. Then within that, we have a couple other pieces where we support our schools. So I'm going to try to flip to a few slides because I want to show you some pictures to go with this without making us all a little car sick. No, um, <laughs> is this graphic really looks at, and we use this all the time when we do professional learning. So learning services supports our schools and then through each of our departments. So we have several versions of this graphic, but it really looks at those four questions of the PLCs. What is it we want students to know? 
How are we going to know if they know it? What are we going to do if they don't know it? And then what are we going to do um, if they already do know it? And it gives examples of some of the assessments and the reports within our map growth system that NWA prepares that teachers can access and review, as well as our administrators or anyone that's working with the students in the district. So I think it's important to think about this from a big level picture around where this data fits within the PLC process. The other piece is we have a system that we call support to schools that learning services support. So each department is represented in that. And so we provide professional learning. Some of it's we provide it and say, please come and join us. Some of it is customized support where schools can say this is an area we want some additional support. So this year, some of our teachers on special assignment or TOSAs have done work around rigor with our schools. Um, recently, we did um, some personalized support for Pine Creek High School along with um, Challenger Middle School and Chinook Trail Middle School because they wanted to get all of their teachers, all content areas together so that they could talk about their instructional practices, the standards they're focusing on, and then really looking at that, how do kids coming out of middle school, how are they prepared to go to high school? And what things as a middle school teacher could I do to help prepare our kids for that piece? So that's when we really start looking at that continuous school improvement process and using data for decision making. So those are some examples of how um, we've used that data cycle work, not data cycle, sorry, I got ahead of myself, the support to schools work um, to support our schools. The next piece is data cycles. And so data cycles are something we started three years ago about um, as a learning services team, where we really just started to get in front of our administrators to build data literacy, because sometimes it's complicated. Sometimes every assessment has different cut points and different pieces of um, information. And so four times a year, we've worked on academic data um, and behavior data and different um, sub or different sets of data that we've worked with through those data cycles. And we've really started to see um, how that's helping the work that our schools are doing. And so that's another piece that really looks at that data for instructional decision making, because if we just take all these assessments and we have all this data, but we're not reacting to it or doing something with it, it's not going to change what we're doing. And for my eight years and my like eight years, I've done that. No, <laughs> I've been the director for assessment. But why I love this work is with that information, we can make changes for kids. And that's what we want to know and be able to do. Um, so I'm going to scoot this ahead for just one second so we can see a couple more slides here that I had. Um, so the data for decision making, some of the questions we ask ourselves. So at the back of your packet tonight, we um, are asking ourselves, how are kids doing? But one of the things we want to focus on is catching kids up, keeping, keeping kids up and moving kids up. And what that means is we've talked about this around like our CMAS and our higher stakes data is that to move a student ahead a full year, sometimes if I'm already working below grade level, I'm going to have to do more than a year's worth of work and support for that student to help catch them up. Because if we just keep doing one year, one year, we will never catch them up to their grade level peers. And then thinking about that move up piece, how can we accelerate and excel kids that are already at their um, learning level? So I just, we've used this handout, the little snippet there in the bottom right corner of the slide, but you have that handout in the back of your packet. Cause I just think sometimes it's good for all of us to go back and um, calibrate what we're thinking and what we're talking about and we're looking at. So I provided that for you tonight as well. And then one other piece that's important is the connection between school and home. We want parents and students to have the information. So tonight I just gave you a snippet of what a family report might look like, but what's most important is the blue link within this PowerPoint and this presentation is where our families or yourselves could go and learn more information about the NWA map growth reports that we send home to students after each testing window so that parents are informed. And then what we're really seeing progress with as well is our students and teachers working together to set goals. And that's something that's been an area of growth we've been really looking at, like we wanted to do more around student goal setting. And so that's, we're seeing that piece become more, um, 
come to life, I guess is what I want to say, like come to life within our schools and hearing about teachers sitting down with students and saying, okay, so Jolyn, this is where you're at. This is the kind of work you're going to have to do in order to get to the, um, the score that we want you to be at or your grade level proficiency. And we want kids to buy into this because we want them to understand it's not just we don't want to just torture them for lack of a nicer word, but like, right, like this is an intentional piece. It helps us see where they're at and it helps them understand where that they're at as well in their learning progress. And of course, that conversation would look very different from a first grader to a 10th grader. Um, so I thought it was important tonight to share that family report piece with you as well. And then this slide just looks back at those um, pieces of, of taking action of how we're using this data and information. So I'm going to transition, unless we have questions that we want to do for me, we can always come back to me. No. <laughs> Any questions, board? Ms. Inez. Um, for the PLC work that's being done kind of across the district, so different schools getting together, which is so exciting, that is like just amazing. The <clears throat> Is there some kind of repository on OneNote or something for those for resources, teaching strategies, things to, like a collection place where we can say, I know someone mentioned something, but I want yeah. to. So within our departments, we have a lot of information that's out there that our schools can access through the intranet. We also have a very extensive um, data collect, not data, um, in OneNote, we have a OneNote that we've done for our principals and our administrators over this time period. So if I'm new to the district, the, the great part of it is I could go back and see what kind of work did we do three years ago. It also gives our administrators and our teachers access to the protocols. So that would be like, you know, like an outline of the kinds of questions we're gonna ask, how we want to look at this data and work together. And so they always have access to all those resources as well. So yes, no. <laughs> Miss Yanez. Two. I love reading. Um, okay, so the read act training, which I'm forcing myself through, I have 10 hours done. Woohoo. Um, Good job. Thank you. It's 45 hours. <laughs> There's lots uh, yes. to go. Um, <laughs> what year was that actually a requirement? And then I think 2022-ish. And then um, what are we seeing from, like, are we seeing um, fruits of that? And then as well, has the state provided any follow-up resources after requiring this training? What does that look like? Those are great questions. Yes, so um, we are in our third year this year of um, having our teachers um, work through and meet that READ Act requirement. It actually extended this year to not just our K-3 teachers of reading, but it is also um, our four through 12th grade um, reading interventionist, as well as elementary administrators. So um, the requirements around the READ Act training continue to grow and evolve. Um, and great questions around, you know, what is the state seeing from all this hard work and research? Um, I can tell you we haven't received reports from the state. Um, we take very close look at just D20, and um, although I know it's been a very heavy lift, it's a, it's seven days, right, of training that we ask teachers to do on their own time. Um, it's it's a heavy lift, but we've all we ask and we hear from our teachers that it's great information, it's great material, and then what we have done as a literacy team and learning services is we've taken it upon ourselves to follow up. So as we continue to train and support and coach teachers, we continue to kind of pull from that training itself so that we continue to pull teachers back into what they've already learned so that it's not kind of a one and done and forgotten situation. Okay, well, actually, I'm just going to keep keep running. Good warm up around literacy. All right, so as we heard before, we know our um, district goal is around 85% of our third graders or more will read, read at grade level at the end of their third grade year. Um, if they aren't at that proficient proficiency level, we are looking at the students to read with 95% accuracy. Um, or at the very least to move out of that well below range. And I wanted to give you a chance to ask any questions about those targets and that goal if you had them. Okay. 
So um, why we focus on third grade. Uh, research finds that third graders who are not proficient in reading are four times more likely to drop out of high school. This target keeps our interventions focused on our K through second grade students where we know additional support and instruction is most impactful. And by systematically identifying third graders that don't meet um, grade level expectations, schools have time to intervene and grow students' abilities before they transition to middle school. So we don't wanna wait till the end of fifth grade um, to identify problems and needs. We really wanna keep track of that and systematically really look at those third graders. Um, additionally, at fourth grade, literacy standards shift the focus of instruction from learning how to read to reading to learn. So you kind of have more of an emphasis on that those comprehension skills rather than things like decoding and encoding. All right, and just a little key page so that the data that we will look at will make sense is remember boy, BOY is beginning of year, MOY is middle of year, and then we have our range um, color codes. Red is well below, yellow below, green is on grade level, and blue is above. And some considerations before we look at our charts and individual grades is that, um, again, as mentioned, um, we have shifted just a bit from the Dibbles Next assessment to Dibbles 8. This was because of the ELAC grant and the assessment that they chose to go with. Um, they did, there was a lot of vetting that went into that decision. And what um, some of the shifts are that, um, Previously with Dibbles Next, students would experience different subtests throughout the year. For example, first graders um, at mid-year would take an oral reading fluency test. Um, with Dibbles 8, all of our students take the same subtests throughout the year. So there's a little more consistency. And in my opinion, we can start learning more and doing more with more data faster. Um, another piece is there was a lot of research done around um, Dibbles Next offers students, they get kind of three reads. So you read a passage within one minute. Dibbles Next only uses one passage. So the, what was happening was that the results really weren't varying all that much between one read and three reads. Although we can, um, we can probably assume that there's a few students that need that chance to warm up. And with Dibbles 8, there's not really a warm up chance. You get the one cold read and then we move on. So those are some differences. We also tested this year before the winter break. Um, that's new for us. And um, really that was an ask from our principals because you know them and they love data and they love to hit the ground running and they wanted to know um, what kind of interventions and instruction would happen as soon as kids are back in January. So we made that shift. Um, and then in the charts that you'll see, TCA, one of our partnership charter schools, doesn't participate in the Dibbles 8 test. They actually use a cadence reading, which if you look at the test, they are almost identical, but it's just a different platform and they're able to give it on paper if they choose to, whereas ours is more um, online for teachers. So their data is not included in the graphs, but we did include it in the numbers. All right, so looking at kindergarten, um, you can see by that shift um, in the blues and greens that they have made tremendous progress from the beginning of the year to mid-year. Um, we have 464 students that have moved from below level to on or above, um, which puts us at 75% on or above at mid-year. First grade, um, you can see that the jump is not as big as kindergarten, but still significant. So 126 students have moved out of that below range and we are at 70% proficient. And you're gonna kind of see a trend um, second grade as well. You can kind of see this trend that, as I mentioned before, the older students get, the more challenging it is to move them. We are still making progress though. So 79 students have moved and we're at 72% on or above level at mid-year. All right, and our third graders. So at mid-year, we are at 74% on or above grade level. And that is including that TCA student data. 
um, we keep working on moving those students out of well below, but it's hard. You can see that not a lot of movement was made. Um, 63 students have moved um, from below to on grade level. And one of the things that I want to point out with this as well, um, the charts show um, all students that are testing and really for our um, target, we really focus on the students that are with us all year um, because we're trying to look at teacher impact. So uh, while the chart has all students, um, the numbers will include only those students who tested beginning and mid-year. All right, and then that overall kindergarten through third grade summary, um, 493 students have moved out of well below. That is 108 more than last year at this time, so that's encouraging. 72% um, of our students are on or above. And again, I just had to put in those trend lines. They're all angling in the correct direction, and we just want to have those become even more steep um, by the end of the year. All right, and then we again will never forget about our fourth graders. So wanted to um, share this graph with you. I find it incredibly encouraging. Um, let's see, so at mid-year, um, looking at those 157 students, um, as I mentioned before, 114 of those are already reading with 95% accuracy or better. Um, so we have 43. Um, students that we are tracking and watching and charting and sharing and doing all those things that we need to do to make sure that they too achieve their goal. Um, the chart at the bottom shows all of our fourth graders who scored below benchmark or well below benchmark at mid-year. And why I think this is important is because you can see those blue bands are students that while they're below are already reading at 95% accuracy. Um, and then those students still in the orange, they're the ones we're focusing on that aren't there yet. So only three students who are below benchmark in that yellow box um, are not yet 95% accurate. And you can see there's a few more in that well below range. But um, again, the reason why we focus on accuracy is because really you need accuracy before fluency. And in fact, um, again, research shows that even if you're, you are a slower reader and perhaps a Dibbles 8 assessment, which relies heavily on the rate that you read, um, you may never really master at a rate that's fast. If you read accurately, you can read to comprehend and that's the ultimate goal. All right, so taking action. Um, as you heard from JoLynn, really everything that she spoke about when it comes to map growth data also applies to all of our dibbles and reading data. Um, we have high accountability. Um, we actually have a document um, that we share among schools, the literacy team. So we, um, Schools are sharing with us their students, how their students are doing on assessments and progress monitoring. We know what kind of intervention they have and what programs they're using. And we, we don't ask that to be kind of big brother and just watch. Our goal is that we can learn so that we can support them. So we're talking to those teachers and we're, we're helping and supporting when it comes to the students learning and growing. And of course, all of our principals know the goal and um, many are quite, actually really all are quite competitive. So you know, we can gamify things a bit. Um, so they collaborate um, with each other as well as with families. And we are, um, just as you're learning in that great 45 hour training, um, we really are teaching and supporting um, our staff with the structured literacy practices and very explicit instruction. Um, our professional learning communities are doing amazing things. We talk very much around teacher efficacy, and it's not one teacher teaching a student, but working together with all of their knowledge and skills to move students. Um, we also in our schools have this flexible intervention time, so students are really receiving targeted and again explicit instruction based on what the data shows that they need as far as their next step. Um, and we just continue to use that data to inform instruction and supporting the students and families. Are there any other questions that JoLynn or I can answer for you? Miss Yanez. <laughs> okay, so literacy interventions. I had a question around that because mm -hmm. I remember when MAPS came out and there was that intervention piece that fell off. Remember when 
Yes, so you get that piece of information that says, here's what this student needs next, right? And so as a teacher, you take that that information, you say, OK, I can create small groups or or you know intervention groups based on that data. Um, and then I know that. Essentially what I'm trying to ask is, is there what is there one or many interventions that we're using as a district? Um, or is there one that's kind of floating to the top that kind of works better? Would you say? Sorry, I really no, I'm like, no, I'm like, no. And it, it, I love that you're asking about the actual instruction, right? So still lots of data sets um, that we use to create those groups and our schools. We have a, a variety of programs that are used. Um, all of them are both REDACT approved and kind of vetted through the district. So we really look for programs that provide that structured literacy instructional pieces. Um, and I would say the other piece that we're just um, continue to be very excited about is our dyslexia specialist um, program and we um, are training those specialists to be in every building and we have some schools that have more than others right now but we have another cohort coming through and so while we do have a variety of programs that we we believe um, are good and vetted we really more than anything are leaning on our teachers knowledge and expertise and wanting to build that because we always we use programs so we always say you know our teachers are the ones who are actually teaching the kids and um, we'll, we'll continue to support them as they do all that learning yeah I'll, and another little spoiler alert i'll give you i'm trying to decide if I, um so you're correct when we bought map growth they had a um a tool also called map skills and so unfortunately about four months after we adopted that they said we're sunsetting it everyone was a little sad. So we've spent a couple of years really looking at progress monitoring, what that means having a definition because we included a definition when we built our balanced assessment framework. And so Tuesday, I think it was, this week we've had um, more vendors come in and so we're getting closer to identifying a district level tool that the priority would be math right now based on the strategic plan, but we're hoping to be able to utilize that for ELA as well. So we're getting closer to have yes we had a very exciting amazing group that joined us on um tuesday over 40 people across the district that participated in that so it takes a long time to make these <laughs> but we're getting there any other questions or comments board mr wilburn i just want to say this is this is very very encouraging very encouraging i mean we all understand the challenges of primary education in the post COVID era that we're living in. And that this this makes it clear that everyone has grabbed an oar and is just rowing the boat as hard as they can in the same direction. This is extraordinary. Thank you. I just want to thank you for the one note that has come in handy on so many occasions. I can't tell you how often I go and look at it. So we're passionate about our one notes. No, <laughs> I, I feel that so all right. Uh, thank you. Absolutely, our pleasure. All right, Ms. Allen, how many people do we have signed up to speak during public comment section number one this evening? We have 12 people total for part one. Uh, seven are students and five are other individuals. All right, thank you. The board welcomes the comments of our community members. Speakers must sign up prior to 1 p.m. via an online form, and they must limit their remarks to two minutes or less. In deference to ASD 20 students, students will be allowed to speak first during the first public comment section. Following any student, speakers who wish to comment on an agenda item will be called in order of their sign up. We greatly value all comments from the public, but in order to adhere to board policy and accomplish the work already on the agenda, the board will not respond at the meeting. Speakers may offer appreciation for or criticism of school operations and programs as concern them, but are encouraged to exercise their speech rights responsibly as they are personally responsible for any legal consequences attributable to their comments, including claims for defamation. Please keep in mind that students often attend board meetings. Speakers' remarks, therefore, should be suitable to an audience that includes kindergarten through 12th grade students, including no use of profanities or obscenities. Comments concerning personnel matters should be directed to the superintendent or board president in writing with your signature. Supplemental written materials can be given to the security guards and they will be delivered to the board secretary. The board president will recognize each speaker and consistent with GP 4.4, comments will be curtailed if remarks or behavior becomes inappropriate. 
The board president may interrupt, warn, or terminate a speaker statement that is unrelated to the business of the school district, inappropriate for K-12 students, or disruptive to an orderly, civil, and productive meeting. Uh, one thing I wanted to say is we got a little raucous last time, and so if there's any break in decorum, there will be one warning. If it continues to happen, then we will ask everyone to clear the room so we can make sure that all disruptions are eliminated. Thank you for your cooperation. Ms. Allen. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and announce the first speaker and the two behind. So Amelia Thiel will start and next will be Emma Hicks and then Tegan Mushell. Hello, my name is Amelie and I'm a fifth grader and I go to Legacy Peak Elementary School. Teachers shouldn't carry guns because arming teachers wouldn't decrease the risk to students. It would increase the risk to children getting hurt or shot. Becky Pringle, a middle school science teacher, states, we need fewer guns in schools, not more. Teachers should be teaching, not acting as armed security guards. <laughs> and this is why we need more teachers carrying books, not guns. Thank you. Our next one is Tegan Mushell, and we'll have Ashton Clark and Ryan Isham next. Uh, real quick, uh, this is going to be a warning. We're not going to be clapping and cheering in between speakers. If that happens again, we'll ask you to clear the room. Thank you. All right, we're going to take a three minute recess. Thank you.
Ms. Allen. Okay, our next speaker is Emma Hicks, and the following two are Tegan Mushau and Ashton Clark. My name is Emma Hicks, and I'm a junior at Pine Creek High School. I'm here tonight for you to see yet another example of how great Miss Cormany is and how much she cared and supported for each and every one of us and how hard it is since she was taken from us. The morale in the school has been off from the beginning. We knew something was up, but not what it was. As soon as anyone had said, had some insight that there was trouble, we came together. Teachers are working hard to be positive and continue, continue to do their job to the best of their ability, but they have lost their leader. Many of us students stopped by her office religiously just to say hi, and since she has been gone, the door has been closed, and we don't have that, that time with her. If there was any way to show you the support she had from everyone, you can look at to the first moment we knew something wasn't right. 67 teachers called off one day, and two-thirds of students were absent. We protested here at the admin building. Parents have written numerous emails, and still there are no answers. We just know that she is gone and not coming back. Admin, teachers, and coaches are leaving at an alarming rate. Students are talking about switching schools and still nothing is being done except finding an interim principal for the rest of the year. Please care about us more. Don't let this happen to other schools and I hope you'll take into consideration what I have said today. Our next speaker is Tegan Mushell and then Ashton Clark and Ryan Isham. Good evening. I'm a current freshman and student of D20 and have been for six, almost seven years. I'm well aware this is a sensitive topic for everyone, but we can all address this with maturity and respect for one another and each other's opinions. In today's society, people are bombarded with the facts, whether they're true or false. But let me throw one at you and move on. Did you know that in Colorado, 75% of firearm related deaths are suicide? And that's only in Colorado. Now, there hasn't been a formal survey for anyone who should have a say in this in this program, including staff, students, faculty and parents who currently have students in the district. So I've taken it upon myself to take my own survey of the people I talked to. Many people said they haven't even heard of faster and those who did all said they are against it. Everyone also said they would feel more unsafe. They felt the community mental health would decline significantly and have all talked to teachers who have felt unsafe with the responsibility and some, if not most, have been said to remove from the district. Now, I understand this is a convenience survey with people I am in contact with, but it's a better one than I've seen my BOE do. Imagine what compelling data you could collect if you did one yourselves. Furthermore, this program costs $1,000 per participant. How many security guards could you hire with that money in all schooling levels? Where is that money coming from? What else could that money be going to in our schools that better education and conditions for people in the buildings? If this program is implemented, I guarantee you will be losing money instead of gaining it. So I urge you to do what's right and talk about your plans with everyone, students, staff included, and take surveys that gather useful information that is not selective but open to everyone. Thank you. Ashton Clark is next, and then we have Ryan Isham and Avery Hook. Good evening, my name is Ashton Clark. I'm currently a junior at Pine Creek High School. Thank you for taking the time to hear our hearts tonight. High school is challenging even at its best, but my high school experience has been made better with the relationship that Ms. Tracy Cormany has made with me and my fellow classmates. Her presence is completely missed and the secrecy of the situation has affected a lot of good staff and students. We miss our good mornings every morning as we walk into the building. We miss our welcome backs from lunch and our good evenings at the end of the school day. Miss Tracy is a light in our school and I justifiably can speak for all of us as students that we are beyond lucky to call her a principal. She strives to know every student at Pine Creek. We are, we are all seen by her and supported by her. Our year has felt so disrupted by the firing of our beloved principal. We haven't just lost Miss Tracy, we've lost so many instrumental staff members. My class is so sad that, and it's not fair that we don't get her at the class of 2024's graduation. And as class of 2025, we started with Miss Tracy. We want to finish with her. She will not be at any of our sporting events, which she attended every sporting event and every school event. We miss our principal and need answers. We as students feel so valued by Miss Tracy and there will never there will never be another principal 
to fill the spot of Miss Tracy Cormier that Miss Tracy has had in Pine Creek. This is not business as usual. Our next speaker is Ryan Isham, then Avery Hook and Piper Bayhan. Hi, I'm Ryan Isham from Pine Creek High School and I'm a junior this year. I wanted to start off by asking you if you have any consideration of the impact removing Mrs. Cormany from our school would have on students or if your agenda has been more important. If the main goal of a school is for the education of students, keeping information from us and even more so the staff of Pine Creek has had more effect than any of you probably initially realize. Taking away one of the main support systems in our school, Mrs. Cormany, has not only left a void in the Pine Creek community altogether, which will be impossible to fill, it's left a void in the lives of students who have had the privilege of getting to know her, which was nearly every student at Pine Creek, seeing as Mrs. Cormany made it a priority to get to know and support every student she had the opportunity to do so with. Mrs. Cormany has been in the school system for an extremely long time and has had an impact on kids from the very beginning. As an example, my mom and dad both had her as an athletic director when they were in high school, and they were thrilled to hear she would be my principal in my high school career as well. If there's anyone who knows the ins and outs and the rights and wrongs, it would be her, and she does her best to help every student and every one of her staff in any way she can. Taking that away from a community and a school who got to experience it firsthand is not only affecting the overall flow of the school, it's affecting the students. Leaving everyone in the dark and not giving any answers to the people who deserve it most is not a way to gain trust from the students the way that Mrs. Cormany was able to do so well. One topic on your agenda tonight was building trust through effective and transparent communication. The way that you have gone about this entire process has shown nothing but secrecy and disrespect to everyone involved. The fact that students are still showing up here today, as you can see, after these weeks of pure confusion, should be proof enough that we care to get answers and we care to stop this agenda you have going on that will not benefit any student or any school in any way. I hope you will all take this into consideration what I've had tonight. Our next speaker is Avery Hook. Behind that, Piper Bayhan and Beth Hoskin. Hi, my name is Avery Hook. I'm a junior at Pine Creek High School, and I've known Ms. Cormany since I was a freshman. She's impacted me and so many other students. One other thing that I wanted to address was that our school has several positions that need to be filled, including principal, athletic director, counselor, and many teachers. I'm concerned that these hiring decisions seem to be made under the radar. The lack of transparency from the leadership from the D20 has caused many rumors to come out of proportion. As a student of Pine Creek, we are, we are all concerned about the future of our school and the uncertainties that we have, we have to prepare to be faced with. As a cheerleader of Pine Creek, I can't imagine going to the sporting events and not seeing her there to support us. Even at cheer competitions that would be held up in Denver, she would always still be there being our biggest fan. Our next speaker is Piper Bayhan, then Beth Hodgkin and Melissa Hubbard. Hello, I am Piper Bayhan and I am a senior at Pine Creek High School. For most of my life, I have been lucky enough to have a family member work in education within the school system that I am a part of. I know education is a tiring and strenuous field for teachers and students alike. Teachers and administrators give it their all, just like our very own Tracy Cormany. As you already know, she has been in education for over 30 years, filling almost every single role inside and outside of a school. She has a child within the school district right now. Although you are privy to all the answers, we have none. Our principal has been on administrative leave since January, with the smallest amount of information being shared to the families of Pine Creek. The one line we received March 1st reads, Miss Tracy Cormany will not return to her position as principal of Pine Creek High School. Because this is a personnel matter, we cannot share any more information. We now have an interim principal, but no answers. With Ms. Cormany's absence, the morale has been lower, students and teachers alike are thoroughly confused, and chaos has risen. We don't need a principal. We don't need scattered emails. We need our principal, and we need answers and transparency. Tracy Cormany deserves better. Our next speaker is Beth Hodgkin, then Melissa Hubbard, then Brian Jewell. Hi, my name is Beth Hodgson. I'm a parent of 
a D20 student at Encompass Heights. We'll be representing Encompass Heights at the uh, Regional Science Fair, uh, STEM Fair in April 20th. Um, there's no logic or reason in supporting book bans. The quest to censor stems from the fear of losing control over one's children. Being unable to dictate children's reading habits translate to, translates to the realization that children may read something the parent never wants their child exposed to. The fear and anxiety of some people is clear. They never want their child to adopt any alternative lifestyle or stray from their Christian nationalist ideals of societal norms. Simply banning books some don't agree with can cause greater harm to the mental health of our youth. Mental health experts say that because many of the books are focused on marginalized groups, women, ethnic, racial, and gender identity issues, eliminating the books further marginalizes those groups. When the reality is these books have the potential to help our marginalized youth thrive, these topics are all ones we should be discussing around our dinner tables. For anyone who respects the First Amendment and the free exchange of ideas, book banning is an exercise in repression and ignorance. Why is this even a point of contention in D20? We already have an opt-out program in place that allows parents to prohibit their children from checking out materials they find objectionable. Why does the ignorance and narrow-mindedness of some come at the expense of my child's freedoms? I cannot think of one instance where those who have banned, burned, or burned books have been viewed as the good guys in history. Who do you wish to emulate? When you shuffle off this mortal coil, how do you wish to be remembered? Would you want your legacy to be compared to that of the Nazi regime, Soviet communism, or perhaps you would prefer to be in better company? It's not too late. You have the opportunity to lead us into the future, a world where our individualism isn't shunned, but celebrated, where our chil children will be better off upon their exit from our district than when they started. It starts here, it starts now. It starts with this board and stakeholders together blazing a path forward of which we can all be proud. Our next speaker is Melissa Hubbard, then it will be Brian Jewell and Catherine Chukas. If this nation is to be wise as well as strong, if we are to achieve our destiny, then we need more new ideas for more wise men reading more good books in more public libraries. These libraries should be open to all except the censor. We must know all the facts and hear all the alternatives and all of the criticisms. Let us welcome controversial books and controversial author authors. For the Bill of Rights is the guardian of our security as well as our liberty, John F. Kennedy. Decisions that are motivated by hostility to controversial ideas or by the desire to conform to a particular ideological, political, or religious uh, viewpoint violate the First Amendment. In less than two years, Book Looks has become the go-to resource for anyone seeking to ban books, especially books about gay people or sexuality from school and public libraries. It is a tool developed by the extremist group Moms for Liberty being used to push their agendas even further under the guise of protecting children. And it's not just individual book challenges citing book looks in Virginia. One school district has adopted the site as an official reference tool for vetting its library books, something that is being proposed in D20. In Texas, a legislator pushed to pass a new law requiring book dealers to read and recall books by referencing an unsuitable book list sourced mostly from book looks. If the board professes to follow the strategic objective of belonging, the district should not be using a biased site on which to base any decisions about books in school libraries. It hurts the kids on my caseload who are LGBTQ and minority kids and uh, and denies them access to books that can reflect their own lives and. Thank you, your time is up. Our next speaker is Brian Jewell, then we have Catherine Chukas and Emily V. I have a quick second before my time starts. I have a little bit of a disclaimer because it's sort of a sensitive topic. Um, it's nothing graphic, I promise. Um, I just want to say that I'm going to discuss a really sensitive topic tonight. Um, I'm going to talk about suicide. So if you or anybody you know have been impacted by suicide, I'd sort of like to give you the informed decision to step out during this. I know I've seen some kids. There's nothing graphic, I promise. But um, also a plug for the National Suicide and Crisis Hotline, 988, helps available 24 hours a day in English and Spanish. Okay. Uh, my, my name is Brian. I have four children in the district. Is, is my time still? Yeah, can we start the timer, please? Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, my name is Brian. Um, I have four children in the district with my wife, um, including a teenager. When I was a teenager, um, I had what I later learned to, um, were called suicidal ideations. 
Um, the short version of why I'm here and why I'm still alive is that I had, number one, a, a, a few friends and family who looked out for me and cared about me. But number two was a book. It was a true story. And I'd like to talk about that book. You see, suicide wasn't a topic that we discussed in my house. Um, so you can imagine my fear when at a very young age, I developed feelings and thoughts that basically opened up the possibility of taking my own life. I was terrified. 15 years old. I had a lot going on. I was eventually diagnosed with depression. I was treated and I got counseling. But what nobody knew is that I was hanging on by a thread. I was ready to fall through the cracks. And I, I stumbled on a book that helped me understand for the first time that there were other people out there like me who felt like me. That book, and this is a little bit shocking, but it was a collection of suicide notes. It was very heavy stuff. But in its pages, I found that I wasn't alone or a total misfit. It planted a seed that eventually helped me heal, resulted in my healing. And so now we find ourselves in the midst of parents who are lumping together LGBTQ and even racial minority perspectives with sexual content. They call the whole thing pornography or smut, their words. And they're saying that this has no literary value. But this isn't about sex, my friends. It's not about purient sexual interests or anything like that. This is about people finding themselves in stories that give their experience a voice. Today's board quote is about turning over rocks, even if what you see can scare the hell out of you. Your quote, not mine. So if one child finds comfort or their identity in a character in a book, I hope we'd all agree that's a win. I often wonder what the outcome would have been if I hadn't found that book. So I just offer that let's trust parents to make their own decisions for their children. Parents, as we've heard tonight, can already opt out of allowing their children to read books in our libraries. Even supporters of removing books, some of whom have been in attendance in these meetings, have admitted this in private. I just ask that we, we get back to what matters in this district, which is our students and our staff and our teachers. Thanks. Catherine Chukas is our next speaker, and then Emily V. Scroll. Um, my name is Catherine Chukas. I live in the district. I'm an Air Academy parent. I'm the SAC chair, and I do have a West Side upside, uh, uh, West Side update, and it will get to animals, I promise. I haven't been here in a few weeks, and I know a lot has happened both with the board and with other things going on. We had a town hall meeting at Woodman Roberts Elementary School last week, and I think about 200 people were there, and I'm just checking it. I see a few people who were there as well. Um, and we discussed the West Monument Creek fire with the fire chief. Many of us are evacuees from Waldo Canyon. We also discussed the West Woodman Road improvements, which will be going on daily until 2025. So it would be great if there's more grace given by the transportation team and the attendance teams for Air Academy and for Woodman Roberts, because our families are going to be dealing with this for another 12 months. And if you attend Woodman Valley Chapel, I know some of you might, um, you have the benefit of police cars directing traffic on weekends when you're there, but those of us commuting daily on Woodman and Rock Rimmon do not. And so we need that grace. The third big thing that we discussed was the indigenous bighorn sheep. In fact, they are called the Rampart Range Bighorns. So if the KRAM team wants to do a news story on Rampart Rams, I got a lot of people that they could interview. It's great to see the KRAM interviews, especially those on today's episode. It had a great recap of the last board meeting. And speaking of interviews and TV reporters, there was a great interview on 60 Minutes last Sunday. If you don't have TV or, uh, or that, that station, you can listen to it on a podcast. The title of it's something like 97 Books, and it relates to item 10 on your agenda. The Beaufort, South Carolina School District had a system like was outlined in Destiny, what we heard about today in Agenda 10A. Parents have choice. Parents have rights. I encourage you to listen to that news piece carefully in terms of how many parents made use of the system like was out outlined in Destiny. It was clear to me that the people raising an issue didn't have kids in public schools and didn't have kids who use libraries. Anyway, that's the information I want to give you. I got it done in less than two minutes. Thank you. Our next speaker is Emily V. As a longtime observer, I have a no vote of confidence that all board members will read the book being challenged in its entirety. At a student-led forum in October, Derek Wilburn quoted excerpts, excerpts from three books, yet when confronted at the Karis Christian Center forum, he admitted, to, he admitted to reading none of the books he questioned. So approving this appeal would also violate GP 4.1 Code of Conduct, which prevents prohibits a board from showing loyalty to an advocacy group, which in this case would be advocates for D20 kids. The person challenging the book is a known member and has a documented history of taking photos of D20 staff high school rooms, which displayed inclusive materials. We also know that since January, Mr. Salt, Mr. Wilburn, and Ms. Shandy have attended meetings at this group, not to mention the leaked Discord chats were 
where three current sitting board members and the wife of the president were members. So approving this appeal would demonstrate ongoing favoritism to members of this group. So if this book is appealed and removed from libraries, I also expect that Mr. Salt would reflect his vote in book ban on his live counter website, Aaron Salt bans books where he refers to himself in third person. So yes, the website uses the same registrar name cheap as Aaron's three business websites, his campaign page, d20dei.org, and prior political candidate websites which hired his political consulting firm, Civic Opus Strategies for Consulting and Professional Services. Mr. Salt has alias websites like Ivy Lou had Facebook aliases. It doesn't take a tech savant to follow the nefarious actions of this board. I would also like to just say that Mr. Salt said that um, as far as the parents having an emotional response to last board, um, that is a red flag for narcissistic behavior. I also would like to know that those rumblings of people being upset on this board for staff uh, call, uh, saying things and being concerned is illegal if you retaliate against them. And I would like to consider this a heat of warning that parents Thank you. That was our last public comment for section one. Thank you, Ms. Allen. Next up is decision item resolution 155-24, Ms. Kynes. I make a motion that the Board of Education for Academy District 20 does not accept the reconsideration of this book is gay in the Pine Creek High School Library and will not hear the appeal. Do we have a second? Second. Any discussion? Ms. Kahn's. This was an extremely challenging decision for me, not because of the topic of the book, but because of some sensitive passages. Um, so it was challenging for me to choose to uphold the previous school and superintendent decisions to retain this book. But as much as I personally don't appreciate one particular chapter of this book, there are other books that I don't want challenged and removed from our libraries based on this uh, same existing district policy and law. Our library book policies are informed by state and federal law as is required and necessary. Though I have previously voiced my disapproval with some of the criteria in existing law and policy, as they stand now, these were adhered to in this book challenge reviews at the school and superintendent levels. I strongly urge all parents to please go back and listen um, to the library book report that we heard earlier this evening and follow the procedures outlined to make informed value centered decisions on what they permit their children to read and check out. If you're also so inclined, I encourage you to lobby for library book law changes to become more succinct and objective. Any other discussion? Mr. Salt. Ms. Uh, Chandy. Um, I think it's important to consider where, where this is a decision to just hear it, that we're not banning the book or taking the book out or considering all the things. We're just trying to decide to hear it. Uh, I've observed the the district policy in action and the procedures that we're asking our staff to go through when they are considering a book. And I don't think as leaders, we've done a good job with those policies because it provides a lot of ambiguity and inconsistency with how those policies are considered um, and how they're, they're played out. The line reads, shall consider. So you could, in theory, consider all nine points and say that they don't meet any of those nine points, but keep the book. And you followed the policy. You've, you've considered all nine. So I think we need to do a better job of asking our employees of how to execute that policy. And this book came, through, came up through that policy and through that ambiguity. So I think it deserves our attention and our time to at least hear the, the arguments both on both sides, um, ourselves. Is there any other discussion? 
Ms. Yanez. Um, so since receiving this book challenge, um, I have spent a lot of time, have read the entire book. Um, my husband can vouch for me because I actually wear like a headlamp in our bedroom so I don't wake him up when he, as I was reading. That's a great visual for you all. But um, December 19th, I took an oath to the United States and state constitution. And in doing so, um, uh, and also had to get really familiar with um, po board policy. Um, I've read um, book reviews. Um, I've learned a little bit more about the ratings for movies and video games, um, how there's there's one organization that rates movies and there's one organization that rates video games. And then there's lots of other people that do their own ratings. But like when you, you know, would go to a movie and you see rated R or, or PG-13, that comes from one organization. We don't have that for books. And so we're really dependent on um, age recommendations, generally laid out by the publisher, right? Um, I've learned a lot. <laughs> I've looked at um, how this got punted to school boards. Um, and it feels like a massive responsibility. So the Supreme Court said, no thanks, right? And state said, let's give this to school boards. And um, so here we sit. Um, I'm a fervent believer in the First Amendment. And I know it works both ways, right? Um, I'm also a, a big believer in parents' rights, and I'm I'm thrilled to see that there's um, information being shared um, by the district with parents to say, hey, if this doesn't fit for you guys, then here's something you can do and curate a collection with your kids. Um, I think I think we can spend an awful lot of time doing this. And my concern is that we get away from the, the work um, of student outcomes. And um, full stop. Mr. Wilburn. Uh, I think Mrs. Shandy makes a good point that at, at this point, the decision is to whether or not to hear the appeal. Um, under the last board, under under Director Lavalley's presidency, I think the vote, the board voted to hear five out of five appeals or six out of six. I mean, you, you heard them all. And that's the right thing to do for a constituent. If a constituent comes with a concern to this board, I think we owe it to that constituent to hear their concern. And then a decision gets made after the decision is made whether or not to honor the constituent's appeal. So uh, I think Amy, Mrs. Shandy makes a very good point. And that's the stage we are at. I think we owe it to our constituents to honor their requests for us. To, whether it's a book that you personally like or want or personally don't, or that should be off the table. It should be about a constituent bringing a concern to their elected representatives. Is there any further discussion? All right. Uh, so the resolution on the table is to not hear the appeal. A yes vote means we uphold the previous decision. A no vote means we will uh, turn this down and want to move forward in hearing the appeal. I can repeat that. A yes vote on this resolution means that we uphold the decision made by the committee and the superintendent's designee. A no vote means we would turn this resolution down and move forward towards hearing the appeal at a future date. Any other questions? Roll call, please. Mrs. Kant? Yes. Mrs. Shandy? No. Mr. Wilburn? No. Mrs. Yanez? Yes. Mr. Salt? Yes. All right, moving on to public comment section number two. Ms. Allen, how many people have we signed have signed up to speak during public comment section number two? We have 20 folks this evening. All, All right, right. Uh, same rules apply as the last time. I'm not going to read all three minutes of that again. Go ahead, Ms. Allen. Our first speaker will be David DeFranco. Then we will have Julie Isham and Carrie Carnes. 
Hey, my name is David DeFranco. I'm a graduate of Rampart High School, and I have two kids currently at Rampart. It's going to be completely different. This is an issue that predates everyone sitting up here. So I was talking to my kids the other night, having a good time, talking about current events and just kind of how crazy things are these days. I made a joke that syphilis is on the rise in the United States. My kids looked at me and they said, what's syphilis? Which was surprising to me because both of my kids have had sex ed at Rampart High School. When I had sex ed at Rampart High School, I knew what syphilis was. I also know that it leads to insanity, which is why I made the joke. So I know D20 doesn't teach sex ed. Sex ed is taught by an organization called Education for a Lifetime. They come in, they've got their own material, they teach it as part of the health class. Through a little bit of poking around, I learned that Education for a Lifetime is a front for the Christian Anti-Abortion Group Life Network. The handouts the kids get say, if you have a question about a pregnancy or an STI, go to one of Life Network's crisis pregnancy centers, which are famous for not hiring doctors or nurses, but having lots of people who will pray with you. There is no amount of prayer that will cure syphilis. I would like this board to offer parents a choice, a better choice. Right now, as a parent, I can say, no, I don't want my kids to get sex ed, or yes, they can have sex ed, which is Christian uh, abstinence adjacent. I mean, abstinence only is illegal in Colorado, but it feels like that when I talk to my kids and their experience. I would love, and I think it would be good for this district to bring in a science-based curriculum for parents that want that for their children. Something like our whole lives, or there are several curriculums that are out there that are not just fear-based Christian. Thank you. Our next speaker is Julie Isham, followed by Carrie Carnes and Laura Boylston. Hi, I'm Julie Arsham. I'm a parent of a student at Pine Creek High School. I am here to voice concerns regarding the recent events at Pine Creek and the consequences that seem to be ensuing. I was fortunate enough to be able to attend the coffee and conversation with Ms. Haber on Tuesday. While I appreciate the content presented there, I took away something very valuable. Ms. Haber, you opened the meeting with pictures and slides showing how involved you are in the school, spending time in each one, hearing success stories, and talking about all the great principals and teachers there are in the district. My question to you is, is that if you have such wonderful staff in these schools, then why are you not interested in keeping them, keeping them employed and allowing them to do what they are so great at? You had a miss, you had a principal, Mrs. Cormany at Pine Creek, who is held to the highest regard, not only at Pine Creek, but from other schools in the district and the city in general. No matter where she was, she cared for her students. She understood the importance of taking care of her staff and she did her job better than most. But still, you allowed someone or some agenda to take her away. Do you know her or what she has done for this city over nearly 30 years? If you did, you would not be asking her to resign. Instead, you'd be begging her to leave her job as principal and mentor all those around her in every position at every level as she knows her stuff. She cares more than anyone you'll ever know, and she can make whatever it is happen. You talked about the importance of belonging, students being seen by their teachers, and if there's anyone who did that and encouraged that, it was Ms. Cormany. Yes, she's gone. You talked about sports sports and their success and the mental piece to being an athlete. Yet you have allowed the sports pro programs to be torn to pieces over this last month, losing coaches from multiple sports. You took a picture with the state winning swim and dive team. Ms. Cormney is the one who supported them and invested in them, and she wasn't able to be there to congratulate them and celebrate them. How is any of this good for the school? One of the objectives you presented tonight is to invest in and value our greatest asset, our staff. Well, Ms. Cormany did that and she paid for it. I asked if she was, if this was a financial matter, why isn't Ms. Becky Allen being investigated? I also would like to ask if there is any cor correlation between the G DOJ investigations of Ms. Haber and the emergency superintendent succession discussed. Our next speaker is Carrie Carnes, followed by Laurel, Laura Boylston and Suzanne Thiel. Hello. My name is Carrie Carnes, and I'm a D20 property owner, registered voter, and a parent with two children currently in D20 schools. So I want to start from a place of gratitude. It's something that I really try to model to my kids, to my colleagues, and to my employees. I want to thank you all for your service on the school board. We don't always agree, but I know that you have a really hard job. I was really heartened to hear Mr. Salt's commitment to listening to stakeholders and seeking input at the last meeting and in his more recent public remarks. 
but I am not alone in being frustrated that there has been no recent outreach to parents to seek input or to teachers to seek input after the controversial topics from the last board meeting. So please, if you truly do care about stakeholder input, you need to seek it across multiple platforms and show that you are listening. Your commitment as school board members must be first and foremost to the students in our D20 schools, only second to the adults, the D20 parents, teachers, and staff who fight for our kids every day. A distant third commitment should be the property owners whose taxes fund the district, and finally fourth to the voters, not just the ones who elected you, but to all of D20. You really need have no commitment at all, none, to people who live outside the district, to people who do not have children here, and people who do not work for the district. That you continue to value input from outside groups, and in some cases, deny internal constituents to give voice instead to outsiders, is really, frankly, a breach of your responsibility. Let's look quickly at a single issue. Nationwide, the majority of parents oppose arming teachers. The majority of students oppose arming teachers. The majority of faculty and of staff oppose arming teachers. And even the majority of law enforcement, your own school resource officers, oppose arming teachers. So if you're not listening to your own constituents, it begs the question, who are you serving? Decades ago, as a debate student, I studied gun safety. The evidence has not changed in almost 40 years. Guns handled by well-intentioned but in Thank you, your time is up. Our next speaker is Laura Boylston, followed by Suzanne Thiel and Lauren Keenan. Good evening, I'm both a teacher and a parent in D20. As a parent, I know the increasing burden that is put on all school staff. With staffing shortages, teachers are constantly jumping in to fill roles in addition to their own. Anyone who has worked in a school knows just how busy and chaotic the day can be. Staff are constantly on making sure that children are safe, happy, and making progress academically. It is completely unreasonable to then expect them to also play the role of law enforcement. Army teachers is opposed by the majority of law enforcement, school safety experts, and teachers because it introduces new risks. There have been several reports of guns being left behind for students to access. Back in 2018, when people represented faster first spoke at our board meetings, the previous head of security reported on school safety and specifically stated that he did not agree with Army teachers. Over the past 13 years of being a parent in D20, I have spoken to our security team, administrators, and countless teachers and staff who agree that this program would only increase risk and decrease response time for law enforcement trying to coordinate with someone who is not nearly as trained and experienced as them in an extremely stressful and chaotic situation. It has been suggested that only non-teaching staff would carry firearms for now. This raises so many questions. What about if one school site has 10 people sign up and another site has no one? Will job postings give preferences to those who are willing to be armed or prevent a staff member from moving to another site because it will leave a school with no one? Will staff be discriminated against if they do not want to participate in this program? Can we really afford to lose more teachers? Our security team at D20 is top-notch, and they know that most of their job is about preventing tragedies from occurring. Our district has been in the forefront of security, mental health awareness, and support, and utilizing the Safe to Tell program, which has led to countless tips that have helped students in distress. I was pleased to hear that the board wants to listen to stakeholders when considering this program. When we are talking about those who would be directly affected by a school shooting, our students, parents, and staff's voices should be prioritized. I hope that my children's teachers and parents will be asked for their input via surveys or stakeholder meetings. Thank you. Our next speaker is Suzanne Thiel, then Lauren Keenan and Amy Mushell. Hi, my name is Suzanne and I'm a mother of two D20 children. We just recently moved from Germany back to my home state of Colorado. I love the inclusive opportunities going to a public school in Colorado offers. We are happy to be in Colorado attending D20 schools. As a family who grew up in Germany, my children are shocked at some of the proposals gun advocates make. The newest proposal to arm teachers in D20 is concerning and frightening to us. The Germans often said the Americans are crazy, and this is a perfect example of why. Arming teachers is not the solution to America's gun problem. If you look at the statistics, arming teachers with guns wouldn't decrease the risk to students, but in fact, increase their risk. Keeping kids safe means keeping guns off K-12 to campuses. According to the Giffords Law Center, there have been nearly 100 incidents of mishandled guns in schools in the last five years including 
a teacher's loaded gun fell from his waistband during a cartwheel. A teacher unintentionally fired a gun in his class during a safety demonstration. For years, the gun lobby has pushed policies to arm teachers. Arming teachers is the wrong decision opposed by most teens, parents, and teachers. Keep guns out of schools and let teachers focus on teaching kids good content. Teachers have enough to do with managing students, creating a positive classroom climate, differentiating content for students of all learning abilities, assigning and grading homework, grading assessments, prepping students for standardized tests, helping students with their mental health. Adding a deadly weapon to the mix to a profession that is already task saturated is wrong. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lauren Keenan, then Amy Mushell and Tim Hoffman. Lauren Keenan. Okay, then our next speaker is Amy Mushell, Tim Hoffman, and then Liz Wilcox. Good evening. I'm a parent of two children in District 20. We moved into this district six years ago because I heard it was so great. I want to say very clearly that I am against having more guns in the schools by arming staff and teachers. I also want to share with you that my 10 year old has expressed his concern with me about this program. He said, I would not feel comfortable having guns in my school. What if the teacher was tired from grading papers late at night and they made a bad decision and someone got hurt? I would be scared to go to school. Please don't make my 10 year old child scared to go to school. Mr. Salt. You stated in the recent KRAM piece that you're currently having philosophical conversations about this to see what the right choice is in our district. As a parent, I do not want this to be that choice. I would share more details about that, but two minutes isn't enough time. Many of you ran campaigns championing parents' rights and fighting for you promised to fight that parents would be heard. I'm asking you to hear me. Are you fighting for me as a parent? Mr. Salt, you also said that this is an emotional topic for parents, students and staff, and that you're looking to other stakeholders for guidance to have a say. Why do taxpayers and homeowners who do not have children who are currently attending district public schools have more to say than parents and students? Why would you be seeking buy-in from community members who would not be directly impacted by this decision? If parents are emotional, it is because you all held a work session at the- Thank you, your time is up. We now, we now have Tim Hoffman, then Liz Wilcox and Jennifer Bergstrom. Tim Hoffman, a little pause to celebrate a two year anniversary and to honor National Reading Month. Two years ago, some words, they got written and a local buffoon with those words became smitten. So smitten, in fact, it was like they were bitten and infected with poison. It became their sole mission to attack those words, but in an odd way embraced them. They hated the writer and set out to debase him. They stalked him and mocked him and brought up his kids. They doxed him online as part of their bid to try and sow fear in the heart of a stranger, to create an illusion of authority and danger. The plan didn't work. Instead, they looked silly. The writer of the words just remained, well, tranquilly. That writer didn't engage. Instead, he chose silence. And for narcissists, silence can lead them to violence. So local buffoon got madder and madder. Their angst and their rhetoric got badder and badder. Till one day with friends, their hatred just peaked. And buffoon's threats of violence online became leaked. Then to make matters worse, look at what buffoon did. Recited obscenity to a room full of kids and defended it. But add to the things we despise next to bully and doxer and they plagiarized. And the kicker, this person, they just don't care because their hatred has moved them from here up to there. And now there they are on the EDU board with collective jaws dropped and you and you are just floored. And not just at them, but we're floored that they made it. Floored that our neighbors would vote in this hatred. With eagles so fragile, mouth so gigantic, it's disastrous. Like a sinking Titanic, they can't hold the quorum, they can't shut their mouth, they're flagrant, disgruntled, they sit there and pout, they're a menace to students, a board liability, their presence is useless, there's no viability, but yet 
there they are, the smug little smile. With petulant posture and thoughts that are vile, pretentious, self-righteous, and arrogant too. When you voted for this, did you know what they do? Or are you now like us, full of sadness and fears at the thought of this person here for many more years? Also, yo, different topic. Child advocacy does not look like visiting elementary schools and engaging in inappropriate physical contact with kids. Never, ever does that look like child advocacy. Please, again, encourage voluntary resignation for those unfit for the board. Thank you. Our next speaker is Liz Wilcox, then Jennifer Bergstrom, and then Laura Furia. Thank you for allowing all of us the opportunity to speak tonight. The uh, text I prepared is actually something that I sent to every one of you and got the standard response. And the purpose of that was to express my very deep concern over considering the FASTER program in ASD 20. Teachers, staff, students, and parents deserve far better than this that you would even think a wide ranging program to bring guns into our schools was a good thing is abhorrent to me. Faster admits they know of no situation where their program has stopped any school shootings, yet you would consider having poorly trained personnel ready to shoot, to kill. A three day training provides little, if any readiness to handle a murderer in possession of an assault style rifle, particularly when you consider that our teachers or other staff members would be doing concealed carry. You're setting public education up to fail. Why not simply admit this is the first step in doing so? It's an easy way to weed out our teachers, staff and students. So you can bring in your so-called religious schools. We are on to your agenda. You are fooling only yourselves. You're begging for another murderous slaughter of children to happen. You claim to not have enough money to hire and pay teachers a living wage, yet you're willing to spend thousands on guns, insurance, and training to arm staff, students, well, not students, teachers, and other service workers. I request you throw out any thoughts of bringing this pro-murder program into D20. If you're incapable of doing so, you are incapable of leading our district back to the greatness it was once known for prior to you being elected. Thank you. Your time is up. We now have Jennifer Bergstrom, followed by Laura Furia and Charlotte Johnson. <clears throat> My name is Jennifer Bergstrom. I'm a middle and high school parent and a D20 resident. I'm here tonight to voice my concerns surrounding the current D20 Board of Education and their ever increasing lack of transparency. I understand the board does not respond to public comment. However, my emails are also going unanswered, so here I am. I have specific board concerns that I would like addressed. Firstly, since the January 4th board meeting, there has been an executive session for legal counsel at the end of every board meeting. This is highly unusual because the need for legal counsel should be an infrequent occurrence. Additionally, last week there was a need to call a special ses session for the purpose of receiving legal counsel on multiple issues. As a parent and taxpayer, I'm concerned about wasteful spending. If we don't have the funds to adequately pay our teachers or to maintain our buildings, please stop getting us involved in costly litigation. Next, from my perspective, it appears that the board is intentionally limiting stakeholder access. I would like to know why the video feed was purposely turned off during public comment section of the previous board meeting. I do not understand why work sessions cannot be recorded and live streamed like they are in neighboring districts. Limiting access and refusing to utilize existing technology understandably leads the public to believing you're up to something. Finally, regarding the discussion of utilizing non-uniform staff to conceal carry firearms in D20 schools, I would implore the board to not brush off staff, students, and parents when there's absolutely no evidence-based proof to support the claim that staff conceal carrying will make our schools safer. This is a decision that'll have a huge impact on the district. Any decision made without extensive stakeholder input and complete transparency would be incredibly negligent. In closing, I'm well aware of the national politically motivated movement that sees 
seeks to dismantle public education, leaving behind only charter schools and vouchers. Over 26,000 kids rely on you for their educations. Think Thank you. Your time is up. We now have Laura Furia, followed by Charlotte Johnson and Tim Falk. Good evening. For the last two and a half years, I've been mostly coming to board meetings to talk about parking lot safety at Rampart. And so for those of you who are near here, new here, I'll give you a recap of why. So November of 2018, uh, in order to avoid traffic and the chaos that was always happening at Rampart, I dropped my daughter off a block from school. And when she was walking through the gravel overflow lot, another student driver in a giant pickup truck hit her, dragged her, ran her over, and ran her over again. And so uh, over the last several years, um, I've been working with the district a lot. And Alyssa lived, her world was turned upside down. Five plus years later, um, she still suffers chronic aches and pains, PTSD, um, can't do all the things that she used to do. So the traffic study that was done and the physical changes that followed have made a difference, but Rampart still needs a lot of work, as do other schools' parking lots. I was at DCC recently at drop-off in the morning, and I could not even figure out what in the world was going on over there. Um, all three schools being dropped off, blocked off from each other. I went around in circles. Um, since the MLO didn't pass, I feel like it will be a lifetime before the substantial phase two changes that the um, engineers suggested could happen. Money aside, there are strategic changes that could be made. If we could give control of the parking lots over to facilities and security, moving away from the site-based model, a more robust, unified, and meaningful arrangement and enforcement of our parking lots could be achieved. Just maybe some semblance of sanity could be made for everyone during the start and end of the school days. Um, let those with the most relevant knowledge be in charge. In the same vein, I approve of more SROs and security officers at our schools because not only can they keep away perpetrators who want to harm people, they could also control our parking lots a lot better. So thank you. Next up is Charlotte Johnson, followed by Tim Falk and Jennifer Diedrich. I'm a parent of a D20 student. I really struggled with what to say tonight, but I do wonder how long we'll be allowed to speak. I do want to talk about faster and how many parents and teachers were turned away last meeting from speaking about it, even though the board said they wanted to hear from any, everybody. I understand that in the written comments from the last meeting, there were 163 comments against faster and two comments for it. I also want to talk about how people who don't have kids in D20 public schools, including the director of the state organization of the NRA, had time to speak up for it, using specious arguments and political talking points. I want to talk about how students of all ages spoke eloquently and rationally, using evidence and examples of why having guns in schools can increase risk. I want to talk about how advocates for faster, citing that shoot shootings haven't happened in program schools is bad science and bad statistics. They don't know what a p-value is. But if I talk about all that, I also don't have time to talk about how parental choice means that there are maybe books that I don't want my kids to read, but I shouldn't be able to dictate that for all parents. I don't get to talk about how important understanding preferred pronouns, DEI and SEL are in my career of medicine and how some railing against them will be detrimental to helping our students compete after graduation in the 21st century. And I have to wonder if, it any, if any of it even matters as board members and our superintendent meet with some groups of parents and not others. So I asked my child, my kid, what I should speak about tonight. He said, next Benedict a gender non-conforming student, teen, who was bullied in an Oklahoma school and is now dead. I asked why this topic. He said he wants our schools to be a place where kids, all kids feel safe and protected. So with the remainder of my time, which isn't very much, I ask you to consider if you're contributing to this district being a safe place for kids like Nex. Next. next up is Tim Falk, followed by Jennifer Diedrich and Catherine Gale. Am 
My name is Tim Falk, a father of five daughters in D20. And um, I fear we are being becoming so polarized that we can no longer respect and carefully listen to anyone who disagrees with our positions. Case in point, last meeting when I started my public remarks, I was interrupted while sharing my Christian values before hearing that I was speaking to protect the rights of those who hold values different from me. So I'm asking you to consider what can be done to lower the temperature in our district. Sitting through heated vented sessions and board meetings and then pushing forward might look like success, but this is likely to stir up more heat in the long term and may ultimately backfire regardless of any short term changes. And then silencing the opposition will induce even more disastrous fallout. So I suggest a more challenging, but perhaps more rewarding approach. Providing a venue for people with opposing the values to sit down together in a controlled environment and really listen to each other and to work for ways to understand and respect one another once again for the sake of moving forward together despite our differences. I don't think this is overly idealistic or simplistic. Rather, I feel it's necessary if we are going to continue to have a successful school district. I have some ideas how this could work, and I am convinced that District 20 can show other polarized districts a healthy way to work through our differences and emerge stronger. So I'm asking the board to consider putting something like this together. I would be, I would be willing to help out in any way to get it started or just to be a participant. And I do believe there are others from both sides of the aisle who are also willing to work together in good faith. So thank you for considering this proposal. Next, we have Jennifer Diedrich, then Catherine Gale and Megan Gatke. We are a military family with experience in six districts and nine schools in three states and a U.S. territory, currently including Eagle View and Air Academy in D20. Our current teachers and admin teams are exceptional. These educators exhibit unparalleled care, kindness, and engagement with their students. The administrative staff goes above and beyond, fostering personal connections with their students. Regrettably, I can no longer endorse this district to inbound military families. My fear stems from the arbitrary and unexplained administrative decisions, such as placing principals on indefinite leave without justification or communication to the affected parties, parents, students, and staff. Additionally, I worry about the potential departure of the outstanding teachers we cherish to districts where their dedication to nurturing children's growth is appreciated by their employers. The educators in this district are burdened with inadequate compensation, excessive workloads, and responsibilities that should not be theirs, like managing transportation logistics. It's disheartening that teachers and coaches must contend with unreliable bus services, necessitating backup plans like carpooling with coaches, parents, and sometimes other students, and enduring last-minute cancellations. Transparency and communication are sorely lacking. Despite reaching out to Ms. Haberer multiple times via email, I received no response. Similarly, attending coffee and conversations with the superintendent only led to disappointment as these events seemed more like platforms for one-sided information where she could control the narrative rather than have genuine dialogue. The recent rev revelation that of this board's consideration of cur curtailing public comments at these meetings is deeply concerning. If enacted, it would sign signify a troubling shift towards silencing dissenting voices, reminiscent of a totalitarian regime. Mr. Salt risks cementing his legacy as a leader who stifled free expression rather than fostering open discourse. Thank you. Now we have Catherine Gale, followed by Megan Gatke and Sarah Silva. Hello, I'm Catherine Gale. Tonight's legal seminar is on conflict of interest, even though it appears that Mr. Salt did not pay heed to lack of defamation lawsuits against public figures and instead chose to try to quell public comments even more. A conflict of interest is a situation in which a person is involved in multiple interests, financial or otherwise, and serving one interest could involve working against another. Typically, this relates to situations in which the personal interest of an individual might adversely affect a duty owed to make decisions for the benefit of a third party. In this case, the students, parents, stakeholders, and D20. This conflict of interest prohibition is codified in the board policy GP411. A conflict of interest is deemed to exist when a member is confronted with an issue in which the member has a personal or financial interest 
or an issue or circumstance that could render the member unable to devote complete loyalty and singleness of purpose to the public interest. Attending the work, se um, work session last week, where we first were dealing with FASTER, Mr. Wilburn and Ms. Sandy both said, oh, this is new to us. We're just beginning to consider it. However, these comments were disingenuous at best. In the forum for the school board, publicized by KOIA in October of 2023, both Mr. Wilburn and Ms. Shandy said that they were in support of promoting FASTER. Now we go further to their funders. Colorado Springs Forward, which is financed almost exclusively by big developers, donates money to the Springs Opportunity Fund, which subsidized your campaign, run also by Aaron Salt's wife. ASD 20 has never stated in response to public inquiry that our schools are full. Thank you, your time is up. We now have Megan Gatke followed by Sarah Silva and Bernadette Guthrie. My name is Megan Gatke. I am a stakeholder in D20 and I have three children enrolled in school. We are a Navy family. My oldest son has gone to seven different schools and is only in fifth grade. We have lived in Europe, the Middle East, Asia, and both coasts of the US. I felt lucky that my Navy husband had a chance at getting a billet in the state where I was born and raised, Colorado. <laughs> I was looking forward to coming home and getting out on the trails and having family within driving distance for the first time in over a decade. I scoured the internet trying to figure out where to live. I chose D20 because of the commute for my husband's job and because it was rated excellent for multiple years in a row. I have really enjoyed the school my kids are at and I love their teachers. They have been professional, kind, and detailed with what my children need to focus on to keep improving. My school focuses more on improvement than anything, which I appreciate. However, there are a lot of bad things happening within our district, and upon investigation, all of it leads back to the board and their complete lack of time and care given to stakeholders. I tried to come to meetings with an open mind and to see for myself what is happening. In every meeting, we have amazing teachers come in and share what their kids are doing. There's a lot of order and excellence coming from different schools and programs. And then I see other things that are concerning like book banning and the suggestion of implementing faster. I want to say I am unbelievably proud of the young brave students coming up here with all of us old people who bravely speak their hearts and concerns. It doesn't feel good to have to spend time fighting back against things that I feel like we shouldn't even be wasting my time discussing. I've had to spend time figuring out why the board is catering to book banners or why board members are hugging moms for Liberty members. Why are videos being turned off? Why isn't there any discussion about paying our teachers more when we have depressingly low teacher pay? What is being done to retain teachers and staff? Why are we talking about faster when there are a thousand other things we can do to make our schools safer that don't involve the risk of an accidental shooting? What is the board? We now have Sarah Silva, followed by Bernadette Guthrie and Patience Byers. Hi, my name is Sarah. I'm a parent of two D20 students and an active duty service member. But tonight I'll be reading on behalf of staff members. I'm so thankful that we are finally talking about arming teachers and staff. This has been years in the making and I'm excited to be part of these conversations. According to Cambridge.org, the art of arming is to provide yourself or others with equipment or knowledge in order to complete a particular task. To that end, arm teachers and staff with money. Pay us a livable wage where we can live in the district that we teach in. Give us the financial ability to pay for insurance, add a stipend, or find a way to us to pay for classroom supplies for our students. Make it so we don't have to work more than one job to support our families. Arm teachers and staff with respect. Give us the respect we deserve to make choices that we have been trained to make. Librarians have the knowledge base to choose books that are appropriate for the students in their levels. Teachers have spent years learning pedagogy to continually learn and grow. Trust them to make the best decisions. Arm teachers and staff with personnel resources. Ensure that there are mental health services available to staff and student at all times. Arm us with school counselors, school psychologists, arm us with paraprofessionals to work with struggling students one on one in our classrooms. Arm us with bus drivers so that we can take our students into the community for career and technical training. 
arm teachers and staff with high quality facilities redesign spaces that are welcoming and safe for all students and staff regardless of gender religion race or health status arm teachers and staff with balance in their lives give them the time in the day to do their job their whole job recreate schedules if needed to ensure that students are getting teachers who have time to perfect their teaching give feedback on assignments and connect with students and families don't arm teachers and staff with guns instead make proactive choices to arm our teachers and staff with resources that will give students the best opportunity to learn and grow. Our next speaker is Bernadette Guthrie, followed by Patience Byers. My name is Bernadette Guthrie. I'm a D20 resident and a parent of two children, one of whom was victimized by Derek Wilburn on October 4th, 2023. I'd like to thank Ms. Bram Schreiber for her earlier presentation detailing the parental choices we have in D20 when it comes to our um, when it comes to our libraries and most importantly educating this board on how to use Follett Destiny to check to see uh, what books are in which libraries. I'm still waiting for you, Mr. Salt, to correct the email that you sent me on December 4th where you claim the book push was in middle school libraries. So I'll look for that in my inbox tomorrow. Perhaps once you verify this yourself, you will admit you will be willing to admit that Mr. Wilburn reading graphic sexual passages about rape and incest to young children who would have no other access to that material is a matter that a real leader and child advocate would address. Um, Mrs. Cons, in May of last year, you wrote the following in an email to a different constituent. I will never condone sexually explicit material being available to minors. I take the responsibility of the district to protect children very seriously and not allowing obscene or age inappropriate material around underage children is critical to that mission. So I ask you this, how has your denial of what has happened to my innocent little girl, you taking that responsibility seriously? Like, I really want you to think about that. I will not stop talking about this. I will not stop using your own words to show everyone what hypocrites you are. I will remind everyone of who you are and what happened to my daughter and that Mr. Wilburn should not be permitted around children. Thank you. Our final speaker this evening is Patience Byers. Good evening. Uh, I just wanna start out by saying, I really dislike that I have to be up here. Um, this is one of my, public speaking is one of my uh, most difficult things to overcome, uh, but because of the recent um, discussions uh, with the school board, um, I feel that it's necessary. Um, regarding FASTER, I'm not really sure what else I can say that hasn't already been said. So why am I up here? Um, my kids, my friends' kids, their teachers, um, the very humans that you are supposed to be advocating for. How can I sit back and not speak up for them? I am here to say that as a parent of children currently attending D20 schools, I am fervently, sorry, opposed to bringing the FASTER program to our school district. Many of you ran um, on your, for your current position on being for parental rights and parental choice. If you truly cared about what par parents, us parents think, then you would go to great lengths to get our opinion before implementing faster. That means bringing questionnaires, surveys to, uh, to the parents, to the teachers and staff, and to the students, because ultimately that's what we're all here for, right? The students. And I'm good, thank you. All right, thank you everyone. Superintendent Haber, do you have any clarifications or next steps? No, I do not. All right, board, was our business this evening focused on activities that promote and honor our mission statement, our belief statements, and our global end statement that reminds us that all students will have the knowledge, skills, and character necessary for successful transition to the next level and upon graduation will be fully prepared for success? Did the board hear information tonight that would require review or revision of a policy? Did the board hear information tonight that would require a new policy? Did the board hear information tonight that the board would like to include on a future agenda? Without further ado, 
This meeting is adjourned.